Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the city of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Councillors, are there any apologies? I see no apologies. Councillors, uh, minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,624th meeting held on Tuesday, 4th of August, 2020, be received, taken as read and confirmed. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the minutes of the 4,624th meeting of Council held on the 4th of August, 2020, be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. And those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention that agenda item public participation. Today we have a, a Dr Nick Folds who will be addressing us on inclusion of a bouldering facility in the Victoria Park renovation project. Is, Mr, is Dr Folds with us? He, he's been admitted to the room. Here he is. Uh, welcome, Dr. Folds. You have five minutes. Uh, please proceed um, when you're ready. Mr. Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, um, do you know that over a thousand people have signed a petition in support of my presentation to this talk? Uh, I put a petition together more than a month ago and have had overwhelming support from the climbing community. I want to talk to you about bouldering in particular. This is a form of rock climbing that involves climbing boulders rather than cliffs. Um, most participants do do both, but it is a growing burgeoning sport within itself. Um, it, at its harder levels requires strength, mental agility and fortitude and technical prowess. I'm here to ask you, the council, to consider the inclusion of several large boulders between two and six metres tall into the Victoria Park renovation project. You have an opportunity here to create a piece of the future that would, after initial cost, not only cost nothing to upkeep, but also be regarded as a world-class and leading facility by the climbing community worldwide. Um, obviously, there are boulders included, uh, sorry, obviously, the more boulders that were included in this, the better this facility would be. Um, there are several boulders available for climbing in other world cities, such as London and New York, but they were never designated as bouldering specific areas. The rocks in New York were just part of the area in Central Park that happened to be there, and they get heaps of traffic regularly. You just need to search YouTube to see the popularity of them. The two boulders in the parks in London are actually part two, two separate parts of one art, art exhibit exhibit that was put in place at some point um, and they see a lot of traffic themselves as well um, but to my knowledge uh, none of these as I said were specifically put in place for bouldering as as an actual activity um, if you purposefully create a bouldering facility in Victoria Park I believe it may well be the first of its kind in a major city in the world Hashtag bouldering on Instagram has 3.9 million posts. This is not a small thing that's gonna go away. People like Zac Efron, Jared Leto, Jason Momoa and Brie Larson all do it and promote its uptake. Um, bouldering is a sub-discipline of rock climbing as I've already mentioned. And in recent years, this uh, sport climbing itself and, and other forms of climbing is one of the fastest growing sports in the world um, and is as soon as the Olympics do actually happen, um, will be an Olympic event, uh, including bouldering as a sub-discipline as one third of that, that, that event of, of climbing. Um, <clears throat> I believe this position to have been so successful because climbers in Brisbane have both excellent community, uh, have an excellent community, which is welcoming and finds new people gaining access to that community on a regular basis. Uh, a lack of outdoor bouldering in the city itself is probably another reason why I believe this petition that I've created to have been so, so successful. There are excellent indoor facilities in Brisbane, which no doubt would benefit economically from a further boost to grassroots uptake as a result of putting these boulders in and around the park. 
The economic perks would also, I believe, fall to other areas of the local community, including people like local climbing guides, uh, caravan parks, campsites, um, the outdoor retailers in Brisbane itself as well. So this would not only be a boon locally to small climbing community individuals, but also to the uh, economic vices that, that stimulate from that. Um, obviously, the most blatant benefit of bouldering is the fitness aspect. Uh, health and well-being benefits are reaped from being a regular climber, no doubt about it. The sport doesn't feel like a workout either, which is a major participation problem for things like gyms, because as soon as you're there lifting a weight over and over and over and you get bored of it. Um, in bouldering, this isn't the case. It's mentally stimulating. It's a problem solving aspect as well, which means it's much, much better in regards for pa uh, participant adherence. And that in itself increases the sticking to uh, the exercise, which means that obesity and overweight individuals that, that might start participating in this are much more likely to stick with it and in the long term lose weight. The same goes for anorexic and bulimic individuals, for example, who are likely to bulk up as a result of undertaking this, um, both of which are, are problems in gym uptake with those particular categories. Um, when you climb, you don't just help your body get fitter. You don't even realize you're doing it. Um, it helps you meditate as well. So it's very good for mental and uh, sort of depression, anxiety aspects. Um, and when, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. And obesity, as I said, being a major health concern, this is something that will, will really benefit from that if you do get people uptake. Um, and lastly, Lord Mashrina, uh, in your Victoria Mark, uh, Victoria Park Mayor's Dr. method. Folds, I, Dr. Folds, I appreciate that you are, you are concluding, but your time has expired. Okay. Um, thank you for your time, but I, can I please invite Councillor Cunningham to respond to you? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for addressing Council today, um, Nick, with regards to bouldering and your desire for it to be included in our transformation of Victoria Park. I acknowledge that you've generated a thousand signatures in support of this, and that's no, um, that's no small feat in itself. Look, as Chair of Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, I'm responsible for ensuring that Victoria Park project the Victoria Park project and make sure that it um, we enhance this significant public open space. Importantly, we want to make sure there is greater community use and access to this inner city land. As part of our vision and our planning, we've been involving the community every step of the way. And residents have come up with some really interesting concepts, including suggestions for adventure and recreation, just like bouldering. As you appreciate, there are many steps in the process to transform the golf course. The first round of consultation generated some great ideas that formed the draft vision and a second round of consultation with local residents closed at the end of last month. Your input has been received and it along with other feedback is currently being considered. As Parks Chair, I'm always looking at ways to diversify the experiences on offer at our parks right across the city. We've always said that Victoria Park will have something for everybody. It includes potential ideas for nature-based recreation. From here, we're taking on board the ideas and proposals generated through the draft vision, and we're moving into a process of master planning. The Lord Mayor and this administration is strongly committed to the project, and you'll be hearing more about it in coming months. We've allocated over $3 million this year to get on with the job, and as part of our $83 million four-year commitment to bring the community ideas to life. Victoria Park will be an asset for our city's generation for years to come. Just as South Bank has, since it was first created all those years ago, Victoria Park will evolve as the city also evolves around it. While we talk about things like final visions, the truth is Victoria Park, like other major parklands, will begin to change and adapt. Thank you for taking the initiative to advocate on behalf of Brisbane's Bouldering Committee and community and for presenting today. I'm sure regular climbers are grateful for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Folds, for your time today and to come and speak to uh, speak with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillors, uh, now begins a question time. Are there any a questions? Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you. Point of order to you. Oh, thanks, Chair. I didn't hear. Uh, I'd just like to uh, move the suspension of standing orders um, to allow me to move the following urgency motion, which I will send. 
uh, that the Lord Mayor stops spending public money on marketing, research and surveys and puts those public funds towards shovel-ready projects to boost Brisbane's economic recovery. Seconded. That's just been sent. There's an urgency resolution being moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cook. Uh, it's been distributed now. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, three minutes to urgency, please. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. This uh, matter is particularly urgent because it's just come to light within the last week uh, that this administration spent $800,000 of public money, of ratepayers' money, uh, on marketing research uh, on uh, in the lead-up to the last council election. And we know uh, that given this administration's track record, uh, that an enormous amount of money will continue to be used on things like marketing and research and marketing of themselves um, over the next year, Chair. So what this urgency motion is all about uh, is redirecting those funds to a genuine COVID recovery, which is something that Brisbane residents uh, are already crying out for and are crying out for the leadership uh, that this Lord Mayor should be giving uh, and will increasingly uh, be doing that as the months roll on, Chair. So we know that this administration has spent this amount of money to date and we know that they will continue to spend money, um, a useless waste of money, on marketing research. So uh, the Lord Mayor was given the opportunity to show leadership in the last week on this matter, uh, and he scripted it as usual, Chair. Uh, can you please uh, just bring your comments back to urgency? It's something we discuss often, but uh, I think I believe you've moved to substance, and I'd, uh, I'd like to draw you back to urgency, please. Councillor Cassidy. Well, thank you, Chair. It's urgent that this chamber uh, via Zoom shows the leadership today uh, and stops this waste of money that the Lord Mayor refuses to show. That's why it's urgent today, Chair. It's particularly urgent at the moment for the Brisbane economy because uh, we know that spending money on things like marketing research is not a good use of money. Uh, we need to deal with this as a council. People are looking to civic leaders for leadership at the moment and what they're seeing from the Brisbane City Council under Adrian Schrinner, uh, unfortunately, is leaving a lot to be desired, Chair. So we think this money uh, needs to uh, stop being spent today on marketing and research uh, um, for political purposes. Uh, no less, uh, and spent on um, uh, infrastructure that will support the COVID economic recovery that we need to see, Chair. This matter is urgent because the Brisbane economy is already coughing and spluttering and it's about to stall. Chair, we need to be spending every public dollar in the best possible way to rebuild the economy and spending this amount of money on research and marketing is perhaps the worst possible use of ratepayer money right now. I'll now put... The, the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter is urgent, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. No's have it. Division. 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 Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. Come on, let's have a debate. <laughs> Let's have a debate. I agree. All right. Uh, once again, those in favour of urgency, please raise your hand uh, and hold it there so it may be counted and say aye. 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 Please lower your hands and all those against Please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Oh. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Clerks, you. When you are uh, clerks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and twenty against. The noes have it. Councillors, I now open question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Chair of any standing committee? Yep, can you see me? Councillor Atwood, sorry, I couldn't see your hand there. Councillor Atwood. Good chair. Thank you. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, can you please give an update to the Chamber uh, on the ferries that were recently taken off the Brisbane River due to safety concerns? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you to Councillor Atwood uh, for that question. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, um, the uh, monohull ferries were taken off the river recently uh, for safety concerns. Um, and uh, I have to say, 
uh, that we did the right thing at the time. And as more and more information comes to light, uh, that decision clearly uh, was the right one to make. Uh, but I have committed to the people of Brisbane that uh, we would return services as soon as we can. Uh, and uh, we are working very hard to deliver that outcome. Uh, last week, uh, we announced that uh, CityCat services will be stopping at the Holman Street Terminal at Kangaroo Point uh, for the very first time ever. Uh, and those services are now stopping at Holman Street and there's been um, some really positive feedback about that. I know that uh, many of the residents in Kangaroo Point would like to see that uh, continue on. Um, and obviously that's something that uh, we'll consider. But in the meantime, the uh, top priority is to make sure we give them a level of service uh, that uh, even though they're quite close to the CBD, uh, there was no direct asset access until we uh, instated the city cat services from Holman Street. Uh, I can announce today uh, that um, through our ongoing work on the ferries and inspections, uh, making sure that uh, we get to the bottom of any safety concerns or issues that arise, uh, we've identified that uh, one of the boats, uh, Kalparan, uh, which is uh, one of the monohull ferries, uh, will be in a position to go back into service in the very near future. I have uh, instructed for that vessel to be put back as soon as it is ready to go back into service uh, on the Balimba to Tenerife Cross River route. Uh, so I know Councillor Cook and uh, Councillor Howard uh, will be happy to see that occur. Uh, at this stage, uh, I anticipate that that will occur early next week. And obviously, in the meantime, we're continuing to work to make sure that uh, the vessel is ready to re-enter service. Uh, and once again, this is indicative of our commitment to restoring services uh, to benefit the people of Brisbane. Now, I do uh, once again apologise for the inconvenience that uh, a number of residents have experienced as a result of uh, the uh, pause to services that has, have occurred. Um, but as I have stated repeatedly, I do not apologise and I can't apologise for putting safety first. Point safety of order, must Mr. Be. Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Um, Lord Mayor, will you take a question about the reinstatement of the ferries? No, that's not how we take. Um, that's not how we present questions. But also, this is question time. So if you have that question, please use it um, at the appropriate time in the session. It's Lord, just in relation to the response to the yeah, question, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, but also um, there are. I, I hopefully nine questions today, and I hope that you get an opportunity to ask that. Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, look, th this is question time. Councillor Cook, you can ask me a question in question time. That's no problem, but I'm actually answering a question at the moment. Uh, in relation to the reintroduction of Kalparan, uh, this vessel uh, is in the best condition out of all of the vessels. And a big part of that is that unlike the other monohull vessels, uh, this one, as a steel hull. Uh, the other vessels are wooden vessels. And as uh, councillors are aware, we had concerns about deterioration uh, in those vessels. Uh, Kalparan is a steel hull vessel, the only one of the monohulls uh, that is uh, constructed from steel uh, and with um, uh, some relatively minor work uh, will be ready to go in service uh, hopefully next week uh, to uh, transport passengers across the river um, into Tenerife uh, and also linking in with city cat services as well and linking in with the city glider services and the river walk and the other uh, great facilities uh, that that particular part of Brisbane links into. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to be, uh, as we promised, putting back services as soon as it is safe to do so, as soon as it is, as it is possible to do so. Uh, and I also wanted to flag as well, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, today, I will be tabling some important information in relation to the ferries. Uh, I anticipate doing that uh, in my ENC report a bit later on, um, but I have some more important information to brief councillors on, and I look forward to going into further detail about that information in my ENC report. But uh, certainly, uh, getting another uh, Cross River service back up and running uh, is a positive thing. Uh, and it builds on the work that we've done in support of Kangaroo Point residents uh, last week in introducing those city cat services to Holman Street. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? 
Uh, Councillor Shreddy. Thanks, Chair. My question's to the Mayor. No, I just have to stop you there. I apologise to Councillor Cassidy. Your, your, your screen froze. You'll have the next question. Uh, the next opposition question. Councillor Shreddy. Thanks to the Mayor. Council officers have advised Council's Public and Active Transport Committee that COVID-19 has led to an overall decrease in public transport fare revenue for the state government, which means that the state is also expecting significantly less fare revenue from Council run bus services over the coming months. Officers have also confirmed that encouraging more peak hour public transport commuters to switch to travelling off peak would help even out the load on the network and give commuters more space to sit apart from one another, which would be particularly helpful in reducing the risk of spreading COVID. And unsurprisingly, officers agree that making officers agree that making public transport free off peak would encourage many more peak hour commuters to switch to travelling off peak when many of our bus services are running well under capacity. So, in light of this. Will you commit to approaching Minister Mark Bailey to negotiate an agreement for free off-peak bus trips for everyone, similar to the free off-peak travel currently enjoyed by seniors? Can you commit to raising this seriously with the Minister and initiating a productive conversation about whether the many potential benefits of universal free off-peak travel would outweigh the lost revenue? Uh, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Shree, for the question. Through you, Mr Chair. Uh, and, and look, uh, it is uh, an interesting question and I certainly don't dispute um, that we've seen a reduction in public transport use during COVID. Um, and I don't dispute that um, fares are part of the equation when it comes to people's decisions on public transport. I think uh, the first, the very first thing that has to happen before anything um, will uh, gear up again in any significant way is that the people of Brisbane have to have a higher level of confidence that um, they can get out and about in our city safely. Now, I know we are all waiting with bated breath um, to hopefully confirm that there is no uh, significant second wave of COVID cases here in Brisbane and Queensland. And I know we all want the same thing there. I know that uh, we wanna see those uh, few existing cases that have developed um, peter off uh, so that we can have um, a resumption of the relaxation of restrictions, um, the increase in uh, people getting out and about and moving around our city, and also, together with that, um, hopefully an increase in public transport patronage. So that, that confidence is critical. Um, you can make things free, um, but if people don't have confidence to get out there um, actively at the moment, uh, then they won't use public transport. Um, so we want to make sure that confidence uh, is there and that there's no second wave. And if that is the case, then, uh, and, and it stays that way, then we can work on initiatives to support uh, people's reintroduction into tr public transport services. And obviously uh, is something that we support actively. Ultimately, as Councillor Shree well, is well aware, uh, the fares are set by the state government. The revenue is collected by the state government. Fair policy is very much a state government initiative. And where we've introduced our own initiatives, um, it, it's done so in an affordable way. It's done so uh, that we can afford to do it, but any wide scale changes to fares would have to be done at the state government level. And they certainly- Point of order, they, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Uh, on relevance, the, I, I can see the Mayor's talking about the general topic, but it was quite a specific question of whether the Mayor will commit to seriously raising this. I don't know if it was a specific question, though, Councillor Shree. You asked the question in multiple parts, um, and there was a lot of uh, quite an extensive preamble. Uh, and I think the Lord Mayor's addressing the first portion of what you said. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And look, certainly I, I have had discussions with uh, Minister Bailey. I have... Uh, my comments on fares are very clearly on the record. I believe that the current TransLink fares are too high. And we have these high fares for a reason, and that is because uh, the previous Labor um, government uh, back in, I think um, it was uh, the late 2000s, um, early 2010s, um, started jacking up fares by 15% a year. Uh, and they set us on a, par a price path which um, turned people away from public transport. We, we had seen massive growth in public transport patronage um, to the end of the 2000s, and then it flattened off, and then there was a decrease. And a big part of that was the increase in fares. My position is very clear on that. 
I have raised with uh, Minister Bailey um, some suggestions when it comes to further targeted initiatives of uh, in, in relation to fares. Look, I'm not going to go into those details, but I have had those discussions with him because I do want to see more people back on public transport uh, when it is safe to do so. Um, and like I said, provided that confidence is there, that people have confidence they can get out and about and that there's no second wave here in uh, Brisbane or Queensland, uh, then we need to introduce initiatives um, to, to get people back onto public transport. I am certainly open to that conversation, uh, but it will, uh, Councillor Shree, have to be led by the state government because you know, the public transport network in, uh, in our region goes beyond the boundaries of Brisbane. And we know that every day uh, there are people um, coming in from surrounding areas on public transport uh, or driving in from surrounding areas. And the best possible approach here would be a region-wide approach, which sees fares changed on um, a region-wide approach. Uh, and it could be a temporary thing. It could be, um, you know, to get that confidence back, changes in fares. I'd certainly be open to that. Uh, but ultimately, uh, our uh, approach on this has been, let's do the targeted initiatives that we can afford to do as a council. Uh, but one thing we can't afford to do is take on the fare load for the entire Southeast Queensland region. Uh, and uh, it'd be good to have a regional approach when it comes to getting people back on to public transport. It is a fair point you raise, uh, Councillor Shree, about getting people back on. We both support the same thing. Um, but uh, council cannot on its own afford to pay uh, for waiving fares in off-peak time. Lord time has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, the Schrinner administration has today released the City Reach Waterfront Master Plan following consultation with the state government and industry. Can you outline Council's plan for a world-class lifestyle precinct in the heart of Brisbane's CBD? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hammond, for the question. Yes, it was, I was very proud today to launch the City Reach Waterfront Master Plan. Uh, we went through it in committee and have been speaking radio and TV since then to make sure everybody knows that the uh, Team Schrinner in Brisbane City Council has a vision that will transform our city's riverfront into a thriving lifestyle destination and, more importantly in these times, an economic hub for Brisbane. Uh, we're talking about the 1.2 kilometre stretch from the City Botanic Gardens through to Howard Smith Wharves. And this reach boasts a rich history that celebrates our unique outdoor lifestyle and our identity as a river city. It has a potential as the premier waterfront destination and it has not been met just yet. There's real opportunity for change and improvement. This document, though not statutory, definitely complements the city plan as being two years in the making. We've worked closely with community, local businesses and landowners along the riverfront to design a vision that will create a greater economic opportunity and put Brisbane on the map as a world-class destination. Uh, officers looked at 22 of the best well-known and successful waterfronts from around the world like Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco and Marina Bay Sands in Singapore to draw out the qualities that have contributed to their success and apply that to our own situation here in Brisbane. The City Reach today has all of the right attributes of being vibrant and an iconic waterfront um, uh, destination. Uh, it's positioned right in the heart of the city. It's got a captivating history. It's definitely got some distinct architecture down there now. It's surrounded by public parks and open spaces, including, as I mentioned, Hounds with Wharves, uh, Kangaroo Point and the City Botanic Gardens. And it is going to really be a direct connection to that major active public and river transport. Of course, then adding in the opportunities of more than 30 dining precincts and uh, entertainment and leisure activities in the years to come. With all the right pieces, we've brought it together into a vision which focuses on creating an accessible and a unified destination. It's important that we see the promenade acting as both a movement corridor with ample room for pedestrians and cyclists to safely move, as well as a place and destination of its own. This vision supports a generous and consistent shared promenade stretching the entire length 
of the riverfront, including a new direct river access point, additional shade trees, enhanced public spaces, and more decorative art and lighting. It really does create a stronger connection to the river with more recreation and tourism opportunities to encourage a diverse range of events and activations, including the possibility of pop-up bars and restaurants over the river and year-round events and festivals in waterfront parks. We want residents, visitors and workers to have somewhere to go every day and night of the week. And when most tourism's, tourists are coming back, we want them to come back because we have something different on offer here in Brisbane and keeps them coming here and keeps them coming back over other options like Sydney in Melbourne. It's all about creating more to see and do in our backyard so we can keep moving through, keep the money moving through our local economy. It is going to take some time before we see this vision come to life and it will require a collaborative approach between council, the state government and the private sector. But we have been talking around this precinct for several years with each of those sectors and looking at the opportunities, particularly through our tourism economy strategy and the opportunities for using the river to get to these destinations from Queen's Wharf right through to Howardsmith Wharves as well. There is so much happening in Brisbane right now. The past six months have had a dramatic impact on our city's economy, uh, put a temporary pause on growth and development. But with a vision like this, we'll see us through the next few years of economic recovery and hopefully see us come out a lot stronger in the end as well. This vision is about laying the foundation for growth and the potential to create thousands of jobs, bringing enormous economic benefit to the city. Jobs in the building construction industry, the largest employer in our city, as well as jobs in tourism and hospitality once we get the businesses up and running in this precinct as well. That is what this, this uh, city council is all about and that is what Team Schooner is about. It's about making sure that we make Brisbane the strongest city in Australia coming out of this economic recovery and whether that is producing visions, opportunities for our building and construction industry to continue or making sure there is jobs in the tourism, food and beverage and hospitality industry into the future. We need this to see us through the short term to rebuild and to recover and propel our city into the future as a world-class destination and the envy of all Australian cities. Are there any further questions, Councillor Cassidy? Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you just said you were going to table some vague information on the nine monohull ferries. Will you commit to publicly releasing in full the advice you relied on to remove the ferries on Friday 24th of July, the survey that Transdev did of the boats, and Council's own audit reports it commissioned. The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, through you, thank you to Councillor Cassidy for the question. Uh, yes, absolutely, and that is exactly what uh, I was uh, planning to do uh, in my ENC report. But look, I'm happy to table those documents uh, earlier. Uh, what I will be tabling today are uh, the reports that you referred to. Uh, and it's important, I, I have um, quite a bit of information to go through here and we may run out of uh, time in this question. Uh, I've, I've effectively answered your question, but if you don't mind me, uh, Councillor Cassidy, I'm happy to go into some further detail about those reports. Now, councils, uh, councillors would be aware that um, on Thursday evening, uh, the 23rd of July, uh, we received uh, advice from uh, an independent consultant about uh, the uh, monohull ferries, in particular the wooden ferries. That advice uh, said that two of the boats um, were unsafe and should be immediately taken off the water. Uh, we took those two boats off the water immediately. Uh, obviously, we'd only just received the report and there were um, ongoing discussions throughout the evening on Thursday the 23rd, um, including um, a lot of discussions with officers and um, the chair, uh, Council Ryan Murphy. Uh, and given that we'd only just received those reports, we took the time that evening to, uh, to go through them, to understand them. Uh, and that culminated in the decision the following day to remove all of the monohull vessels from the water um, by the close of business on that Friday, the 24th of July. Now, uh, the report or the advice that we received at that time indicated that the two vessels needed to come off definitely uh, but the remaining vessels could uh, go into service, but ultimately there was some really urgent and important 
work that had to be done uh, before they could go into service. And uh, there were still a lot of unanswered questions about the safety of those vessels. Uh, and so in making that decision, um, out of the abundance of caution, uh, we didn't want to be in a situation where we're putting uh, members of the public and staff from TransDev at risk in boats that uh, we had received some pretty concerning advice on. Uh, and so we took that action. Uh, and in that report um, and in that advice, uh, the, uh, the vessels were examined and some of the types of, uh, I guess, descriptions of the condition of those vessels included uh, rotten planks and frames, faulty bilge pumps, significant rust and corrosion, uh, water in the bilges, weakened structural integrity of the hull, missing far fasteners and rotten hatch combing. Now, uh, these vessels, as uh, councillors are aware, are more than 30 years old and some of them are approaching about 36 years old. Um, the maintenance of these vessels has always been uh, and continues to be the responsibility of the operator. Uh, council has never operated these vessels. They have always been operated external to council. Um, as Council Murphy pointed out, we are not uh, maritime experts. Uh, we're very proud of uh, our ownership of the ferry fleet and our funding of it, um, but we've never claimed to be experts in operating ferry services. We are very proud of our operation of bus services and in that field, Brisbane City Council are uh, quite clearly experts Australia-wide. Now, we uh, have um, also been made aware once we took the vessels off the uh, water and we provided the information that we had to the operator, Transdev, uh, we have since been provided with a, uh, a, a further report. And that report was commissioned by Transdev. Now, this is where things get interesting. Our report, uh, done by independent experts, raised serious safety concerns about the vessels. Uh, and they were, those concerns were enough to cause us to take all of the vessels out of the water to guarantee the safety of the travelling public and staff. We subsequently received a report via TransLink, the operator, from uh, a firm that they had commissioned to do a further report. And that report, uh, which um, uh, they provided to us uh, since then, indicates that um, the vessels are in okay condition and there's no real reason to take them off the, the water um, other than a few minor tweaks. Now there's a big variation in those two assessments and uh, obviously that got us asking some serious questions about why would there be such a variation between two independent or external reports. Now the first uh, question. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. I also have a further question for you. Uh, in your response, you said that you're happy for the documents to be tabled now. Uh, they are here. Would you like them to be distributed? To the table? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm not sure what the process is via Zoom, but uh, I want every councillor to get access to these uh, and also the media and members of the public. So uh, whatever the process is that we can make that happen, uh, Mr. Chair, that'd be fantastic. That will be. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, there is a hard copy here uh, that I will certify and then uh, they'll be distributed electronically to your ward emails. Further questions? Um, further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham. Two council projects recently won prizes in the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects Queensland Awards. Can you outline which projects were awarded with these prestigious accolades and how council continues to deliver a cleaner and greener Brisbane? Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Chair, and through you, thank you for the question, Councillor Davis. Brisbane is home to world-class parks and gardens, and this administration continues to invest in new and improved spaces for residents to meet, play and discover. Just as councillors were wrapping up our budget sittings in late June, the Queensland chapter of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, otherwise known as AILA, held their annual awards. It's 2020, so just like everything else, they had to pivot, and it was naturally a virtual award ceremony this year. 
the awards recognize and promote the outstanding work done by landscape architects in creating a better community through the planning and design of the built and natural environments. Brisbane City Council is proud to have access to many outstanding landscape architects in our ranks, and we also collaborate with leading private design firms to deliver unique and fit for purpose public spaces that create a positive impact for residents and the natural environment. I'm pleased to report to the Chamber, Mr Chair, that Brisbane City Council took out two awards at this year's ceremony. In the cultural heritage category, the Hills Avenue Boardwalk at the City Botanic Gardens won the prestigious Award of Excellence. The Hills Avenue Boardwalk is a 100 metre long timber boardwalk in Brisbane's beautiful City Botanic Gardens, which was opened late last year. This stunning addition to the gardens was designed to fit carefully into the avenue of historic big trees and improves connectivity across the gardens to the All Abilities Playground and Queen's Park lawn. Hills Avenue, named after the garden's first curator, Walter Hill, is a double row of 13 fig trees planted in 1865 and 1866. The avenue formerly had paving along it installed in 1987, but this affected the tree's health, so it was removed in the late 1990s. The avenue is a major visitor draw card to its picturesque nature and direct link between Bunya Walk and the core of the gardens. Construction of All Abilities Playground in 2014 also added to a number of visitors walking through and around the avenue, creating accessibility issues and risks to tree health. In awarding this project, the Ayla jury said of the boardwalk, a beautiful, simple and elegant piece of landscape architecture nestled into its setting. This is a clever response that has unlocked a once lost landscape to become usable once again. A very contemporary response to working under and around heritage trees. The project takes the Queensland deck vernacular into a civic scale in keeping with the size and grandeur of the figs that sit over it. And this, a deceptively simple and elegant solution that gives so much to the city by opening up this place to become all inclusive and open to all combinations of activity, both day and night. The jury wholeheartedly agreed this was a stunning piece of landscape architecture. In the urban design category, Council received a landscape architecture award for the Milton Urban Common in Council of Matics Ward. Also completed in late last year, the Milton Urban Common features two fully accessible, generous seating areas with long banquet style tables and shade pavilions, a central turfed area for informal recreational uses, large trees to provide shade, including three feature figs, new fully accessible amenities, lush sub subtropical planting in carefully placed garden beds that manage and capture local stormwater overland flows, a basket swing with surrounding seating and an edible garden featuring herbs. The Ayla jury said, this is a well-designed and welcome addition to an evolving inner city neighborhood with limited open space amenity a deceptively simple design that managed to, to accommodate a range of competing urban and everyday uses from ball kicking, sausage sizzling, dog walking, kid swinging and general meet and greet. And this, a handsome inner city park that is well grounded in consultation with the community. I'd like to congratulate all the officers who were involved in these award-winning projects. During the recess, I had the pleasure of meeting with representatives from Ayla Queensland, including its president, David Yulman. Landscape architects have a palpable passion for creating great places in our city and suburbs, and the Lord Mayor and I wholeheartedly share this passion. It's while we will continue to invest in our public spaces, including our commitment to transform Victoria Park with $83 million committed over the next four years. But right across Brisbane, we are creating places for nature, relaxation, discovery and reconnection. Projects that will be transformative for our city and support jobs, Madam including Hanks, the landscape architects. Are there any further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, under your watch, councillors spend more than $800,000 on market research and surveys. More than $112,000 of that spend was on calling around 2,400 residents to ask if they are satisfied with council services. 
when it is possible to conduct free surveys like this online, each of the phone calls cost about $47 on average. Lord Mayor, do you really think the residents of Brisbane will be happy with you wasting $47 of their money on a single phone call? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and to you, Councillor Cassidy, for the question. Uh, I have to say, uh, market research and the uh, various components of making sure that uh, council is scientifically testing uh, the views of residents uh, is something that is not new, uh, and, I, and I believe it started uh, back in the Labor days um, and has continued on year after year. Almost a million. Not forty-seven dollars of phone call. Thank you. Please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question, Lord Mayor. Uh, but what I can say is that the, um, the the opposition, it wouldn't surprise you, Mr Chair, has been uh, once again caught out misrepresenting the truth because uh, the uh, money that's been invested into um, engaging uh, market research services and scientifically testing um, the views of residents uh, is actually less in the past 12 months than it has been in the past. Um, and so uh, this claim that Labor makes uh, is just... That's even more shocking. I don't know, please, uh, please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question. Lord Mayor. Uh, but I can tell you uh, what uh, it is not. Um, it's not half a billion dollars, Councillor Cassidy, uh, which is what um, your work experience kid put up on social media, or maybe you put up on social media after a few drinks uh, last Lord, night. Lord Mayor, uh, Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor I'm going to have to... Chair. To please allow me to address this first. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor, um, all uh, comments need to be through the chair and uh, can we please address councillors in the third person by their title? Point of order to you, You councillor. reckon that's the problem? Uh, yeah, Chair. I, I think that the Lord Mayor has just reflected on a council employee as a, and I quote him, a work experience kid and then accused me of getting drunk, I think, and... Um, putting things on Facebook, which is actually quite offensive. Less offensive to me. I don't really care what he says about me. But when he reflects on council employees like that, I think that just shows how despicable um, this guy is, Chair. But I think you need to ask him to withdraw those comments. Point of order um, has been made. Uh, no councillors will reflect adversely on other councillors or on council employees. Um, and uh, Lord Mayor, could I ask you to consider... No, I will ask you to withdraw uh, those comments, please, those last two comments about the staff member and... Councillor Cassidy. Oh, for sure, Mr Chair, uh, if you uh, believe that's advisable. But I did want to find an explanation as to why um, Labor for Brisbane put up a post claiming that I had spent over half a billion dollars on market research last night. Uh, I'm just very curious about that. And the post goes on to say, this is the same Lord Mayor that cancelled curb cancelled curbside collection to save a few bucks. You can see a theme here. Labor's not too good with figures uh, because it wasn't a half a billion at all. They got that figure wrong. Um, so fake news there. And a few bucks, Councillor Cassidy, is $6 million a year, uh, which is what it costs to deliver curbside collection. Um, so Labor's financial ineptitude is on clear display here. Uh, these are people that will say and do anything. And the, the post was very much in the flavour of their to put order, a order, chair. Failed yeah. election order, campaign. Chair, negative distribution. Yeah, just on. Oh, you've got to be quiet now, Lord Mayor. Just, um, just on relevance, chair. Um, the question was about a forty-seven dollars spend per phone call. Uh, just wonder if you could redirect the Lord Mayor to that question. The Lord Mayor's answer has been about the quantum uh, in the uh, issue identified, and has been the whole time. No, it hasn't. I don't. Yeah, don't don't challenge me, please. That's my ruling, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was pointing out that Labor just can't be trusted when it comes to money. So uh, his claim about a cost per phone call, I, I don't believe that either. Um, that is... They're your figures. Uh, no, no, you no, gave no, them to us. Councillor Cassidy, uh, please refrain from interjecting. You've interjected quite a bit on this question in particular. Uh, if you continue to interject, I'll move to the formal processes for Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy... Um, never likes me to answer a question, um, but he keeps asking them and I will keep answering them. Uh, but the reality is Labor cannot be trusted when it comes to financial issues. They just put out time after time, false information. They make false claims. And as I was saying before, Mr. Chair, it reminds me of the dishonest 
uh, untruthful campaign they run uh, they ran in the recent election where they spent two order, chair. million dollars on fake news posts point like the one that they put up last night. Point of order to you, Councillor Cassidy. Relevance, Chair. This question was very specific. Uh, it was about council expenditure on, on a particular uh, item <coughs> and the Lord Mayor. Yeah, not the last election. It was about the $800,000 expenditure on market research, Chair. I'm happy to repeat the question. Uh, no, I understand the point of order you're making and I, I believe that the, the Lord Mayor is is addressing the fundamental point of the question you've made, Lord Mayor. It is absolutely critical, uh, Mr Chair, um, that as one of the many tools that we have uh, to offer good, solid, stable and responsible governance on behalf of the people of Brisbane, uh, that we invest in scientifically testing the views of Brisbane residents. Now, uh, we know uh, that every ward office receives feedback um, that feedback is uh, absolutely something we take seriously. You don't listen. Uh, you no, do no, not no, listen. No, no Councillor Johnston, please don't object. Lord Mayor. Uh, uh, we know that um, uh, a whole range of people contact council through multiple channels, but we also know, and experience shows, and common sense shows, that uh, those people are not always exactly reflective of what the wider population believes on a particular matter. Uh, uh, because... Uh, those people are highly motivated to contact council about a particular issue. Um, and uh, we want to hear from them by all means, but we also want to hear from the people that may not contact council proactively. $47 a phone is, call. That is absolutely important. But I'll tell you the type of things that uh, this market Probably. funding is investing in. Uh, things like parking meter testing to support the optimum parking meter solution from a customer experience perspective. Uh, it's about responsible pet ownership, uh, working out uh, with engaging with residents and getting their feedback. You're not even talking to your own people. No, no, Johnston, if please, you talk no, to us, you can find Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you for your protection against those um, uh, inappropriate interjections, Mr Chair. Uh, working with residents on how we can increase the rate of microchipping and what type of initiatives uh, that would be effective in doing this and also uh, increasing the, uh, the rate of desexing of pets um, to look at uh, trends across different suburbs and across areas. Uh, it's also about making sure that uh, we do um, the most effective programs when it comes to street and park trees, determining what residents value most and what concerns the most about tree and uh, park and street trees in public spaces. We know that uh, inquiries and complaints about trees, for example, make up a huge proportion of uh, traffic through the ward office. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Landers. Chair, my question is to the Chair of the Community, Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards for 2020 recently closed two submissions. Can you please inform the Chamber about the competition theme of suburban life and how many entries were received this year? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, Chair, thank you to Councillor Landers for the question. Uh, the Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards is something that we look forward to every year here in Brisbane. It's a wonderful opportunity for budding photographers to show off their work and to help celebrate Brisbane's lifestyle, people and places. So 2020 is a year like no other, and so this year the Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards had a special theme focusing on suburban life in Brisbane. Our way of life has changed in so many ways. And so this year's competition is an opportunity to capture how the coronavirus has impacted our lives through the eyes of residents. We've definitely been spending more time at home with family, experiencing and appreciating suburban life. It's all about appreciating the things we've had more time to explore and enjoy over the past few months. It could be something as simple as discovering an eye-catching something in your backyard, visiting a local park or experiencing a new walking track. These are the little things that can sometimes become big sources of inspiration when you get behind the camera lens. This is now the eighth year that we're holding the Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards and they are open to anyone who lives, works or studies in Brisbane with an eye for photography. Students, amateur and professional photographers. The best part about these awards is that you don't need to be a professional photographer. 
everyone who entered this year has the chance to win a share of up to $14,000 in prizes. There are four categories that were available for entry with seven cash prizes available. Entries closed last week on Wednesday, and I'm pleased to announce that we received more than 1,900 entries this year. So our judges have a very big task ahead. They will be looking for standout photos that showcase Brisbane's character, our vibrant lifestyle and stunning scenery all through the lens of our suburb. In previous years, we've received photos of everything from stunning sunsets to festivals and backyard, backyard catch-ups with friends. Categories include the new Green Heart category, which provides a special focus on our beautiful environment, as well as open, student, people's choice and social media. It's been wonderful to see so many people get involved with the Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards, and it's just one of the many ways that we are creating more to see and do closer to home while also celebrating Brisbane's talented photographers. The fact that you don't have to be a professional photographer is a big draw card for these awards, and it's been great to see the entries just get better and better every year. Last year, we celebrated Brisbane's lifestyle, people and places with William Fryer taking out the open category with his snap of the moonrise and sunrise over the Brisbane River. Last year's winning entries and runners-up are all available to see on Council's website by searching for Lord Mayor's Photographic Awards. We are certainly looking forward to seeing the finalists of this year's competition and discovering more places and activities happening in the suburbs through the eyes of our residents. And so I thank all of the residents who've entered this year's competition. It's truly marvellous to see the number of entries that we've received and I'm very much looking forward to sharing some of those with all of our colleagues and to encourage all councillors to get as many local residents involved when voting for the People's Choice Award, which opens next month from the 2nd to the 30th of September. So through you, Chair, I once again encourage everyone to make sure that they keep an eye out for all of the wonderful entries that will be appearing very soon. We know that the People's Choice um, Award has been very popular. Last year, we had over 4,000 people vote in that award. So we're looking forward to um, more and more people um, taking that opportunity, particularly as, the, as we're talking about our local suburban areas and to know that those photographers have really put their heart and soul into um, what we're going to be seeing in, in, the, in, the, in the competition. So once again, please, councillors, make sure that you vote in the People's Choice Award. And um, thank you very much uh, through you, Chair, to Councillor Landers for the question. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it's been revealed that Council has spent more than $800,000 on market research and Council surveys and much more, uh, you've just said, in previous years. Uh, more than $100,000 of that was spent on an online survey to evaluate Council and the Living in Brisbane newsletter, which has your face printed all over the front page every month. The feedback I receive about this useless newsletter is that it at least encourages recycling as it immediately ends up in a yellow top bin. Around 2,000 kilometres of footpath is still broken, dangerous and in desperate need of repair across Brisbane's suburbs. Lord Mayor, why are you more interested in spending the money of Brisbane residents on marketing yourself instead of fixing basic community infrastructure like footpaths? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, well, Councillor Cassidy, the, the premise of the question is 100% incorrect uh, because this administration's top priority is always investing in infrastructure, improving our city, uh, delivering a better Brisbane tomorrow than we have today and investing in things like the basics all the way from footpaths up to major projects. Uh, we are proud of our record and that record is quite clear. Uh, in fact, already uh, in, uh, in this particular, um, in the last financial year, uh, we fixed more footpaths than Councillor Cassidy and his colleagues promised to fix in a term of office. They went into the election promising they would fix 700 broken footpaths from memory. Uh, and as we heard earlier on in the sessions a couple of months ago, already by that time, 
uh, we'd fixed over a thousand broken. Not football. fixed, replaced. There's a big and, difference. And uh, we are proud of our record of taking the quality uh, and the status of our footpaths up from the appalling state it was in when Labor was in administration, where something like 42% of footpaths were rated as being in a good condition. Uh, and now we have uh, extraordinary improvement in those results. We've lifted the standard of footpaths right across the city. We're investing more than ever in those footpaths. Uh, and we are very proud more of it. More than a year to get a... Basics like footpaths and road maintenance. More than a year. And also improving our local parks and suburban precincts. Uh, this is what we have consistently done in office. This is what we will continue to do in office. And guess what, Councillor Cassidy? Uh, when you talk to people about it on the street, they appreciate the work the council's doing. And when they and when you talk to people about the Living in Brisbane newsletter, uh, people love receiving that newsletter. Oh, uh, people find it very useful. Uh, and they look forward to finding out what's going on in their suburbs and around Brisbane, the events that are on, the projects that are people that uh, people are looking forward to seeing delivered. They love it, Councillor Cassidy, uh, and that's verified by research. Uh, we know that they love it because people talk to us about it, uh, but it's also scientifically verified, Councillor Cassidy. But I'll tell you one thing that's not verified. The couple of union hacks that call you up to complain about the newsletter, that's not scientific, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, that's just Labor Party members spouting the Labor Party line. Uh, and that's why... Mayor, can I ask you just to once again address all comments through me, please? Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, through you to Councillor Cassidy, uh, what is scientific is that people appreciate being notified by a council of what council is doing on their behalf and the, the things that we're doing uh, to deliver a better Brisbane. Uh, but also they appreciate being asked for feedback. And we do that in a whole range, a multitude, a myriad of ways where we ask for people's feedback. We provide uh, plenty of opportunities to engage directly with residents, but we also make a point of engaging with the residents who don't necessarily proactively contact us. Uh, as I said before, uh, it's those quiet Brisbane residents who may not proactively count, uh, contact council or their local councillor or their ward office that we wanna hear from as well. We wanna know their views because they're important to us. And the person who is quiet is just as important as the person who is noisy. And they all have an equal stay in the running of the city. And that's why we do invest in a whole range of different techniques to make sure Please, you people can have their say and to make sure we're engaging with the residents of Brisbane, to make sure that we have our finger on the pulse of Brisbane residents. And we make no apology for doing that because it makes us a better administration. It makes us do a better job when we have a whole range of ways to get public feedback, to know what the public is thinking and to know how we can do better for them. Because we are focused every day. We wake up every day thinking about how we can do better for the residents of Brisbane. And you know what? Market research is one of those things because it, as I said, is a scientific way of yeah, yeah. determining the views of people who may not proactively contact council. Their we views are important. Their views are important Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cassidy, we listen to everyone, not just union officials, through you, Mr Chair. That concludes question time. Councillors, I now draw your attention to the committee reports. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion. The Brisbane City Council commit to reinstating the Norman Park Cross River Ferry Route as soon as the next available monohull vessel can return to the water following the reinstatement of the Belimba to Tenerife Route. I'm just emailing that through now. Seconded. Thank you. I've got an urgency motion moved by Councillor Cook, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, it will be distributed uh, once it arrives in the uh, inside the team's um, emails here. It will be distributed to all councillors. Councillor Cook. You have three minutes to urgency, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, today we have just heard that one of the Munahol vessels that services the Cross River Ferry routes can return to the water for the Bulimba Tenerife route. Of course, uh, Mr Chair, I welcome that announcement. And although I am disappointed that the first I am hearing about it is in the chamber today, I know my local residents will welcome uh, the return of that service next week. The Bulimba to Tenerife Cross River Ferry is one of the most utilised routes in the city and we need to ensure that we are encouraging local residents onto public transport and off our roads. 
Uh, however, Mr Chair, what is missing from the announcement today is a plan forward about the next vessels to return to the water. Uh, of course, we will review the Transdev and BCC uh, audit reports that have been provided by the Lord Mayor a short time ago. Uh, but what is clear from today's announcement that there is a possibility of further vessels returning to the water. I would like the Chamber today to urgently consider reinstating the Norman Park Cross River Ferry route after the Belimba route is reinstated next week. Mr Chair, this is urgent because the Norman Park Ferry Terminal is unable to accommodate city cats and there are limited public transport alternatives for local residents who rely on this service. Uh, Mr Chair, of course, uh, I will concede that Norman Park is not the busiest in the network, uh, but that should not necessarily be the test. Uh, I have had many Norman Park residents in particular contact me who rely on this service daily, who have expressed concern about a trip that used to take around four minutes, now taking well over an hour by a bus for the same trip. So today uh, I'm asking the Lord Mayor and Council to urgently consider this motion to reinstate the Norman Park Cross River Ferry as the next route uh, following the reinstatement of Belimba to Tenerife next week. Uh, just to be very clear, I am in no way asking for the Belimba to Tenerife to not be reinstated. What I'm asking for is that the next uh, cab off the rank, I guess, or uh, vessel off the rank, so to speak, uh, be the Norman Park ferry route. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll now put the resolution on the matter of urgency. All those who believe this is urgent, please raise your hand and say aye. No. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands and those against, please say no and raise your hands. No. no. Oh, I think that's that's it is. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. The noes have it. Um, oh. Thank you. Please. Division. Division. Council Cook, please ring the bells. That's disappointing. Okay, we'll just come back. All right, councillors, all those who support urgency, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. No. 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 Thank you, councillors. Please lower your hands. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being five in favour and 21 against. The noes have it. Uh, thank you, councillors. We'll now move back to the agenda. The Establishment Coordination Committee report, please, the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 3rd of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 3rd of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate the Lord Mayor? Uh, point of uh, order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, uh, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, um, Mr Chairman, I'm seeking further information with respect to uh, item C, the lease of premises for the Centenary Community Hub. Um, that item refers to... Uh, the lease uh, in paragraph 25, it refers to an increase of 1.4% on the gross payable rental under the current lease. Um, the current increases, annual increases um, for the existing or the previous um, lease are not detailed. And I am seeking that information on what the increases, the annual rental increases were under the existing uh, lease that is currently sought to be replaced. Thank you. The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I, uh, I just flagged that I have quite a bit of information to cover in my report and we'll 
probably need an extension of time. Um, so thank you for your forbearance there. Uh, I was uh, mentioning in question time, um, uh, providing an update on the status of the mono hull ferries and, and the work that had been done there. And I, I got to the point just before the end of the question where I talked about conflicting advice that had been received between different consultants uh, who had been independently engaged to, to look at the ferries. And um, we have a situation where council has engaged independent consultants. They have raised uh, significant concerns about the safety of the fleet. Uh, and then we'd also had the operator Transdev had engaged their own consultants who had provided click conflicting advice. Now, um, someone mentioned before that I had mentioned Translink um, in my previous question. I was referring to Transdev, not Translink. Uh, Transdev being the, um, the private company that operates the ferries on our behalf. Um, so uh, if I did make that mistake, apologies, I was referring to Transdev. Uh, but Mr. Chair, the conflicting advice uh, was really interesting because on the one hand, you had a really concerning report uh, raising serious safety and structural uh, issues with the vessels. And on the other hand, um, the report was uh, conflicting saying that, yeah, look, a um, bit of minor minor work and the, and the vessels are all good to go. And uh, so when you look at the reason for these two independent reports being so different, uh, the first question and the first issue that is critical uh, has to be the level of detail included in that report and those inspections. Now, uh, when it comes to this type of testing on vessels, uh, there's a range of different testing that can occur uh, or a range of different inspections that can occur. Um, they range from a visual inspection, um, uh, and when you go, that's a, a low level inspection effectively, and then you go to higher level inspections, and there's two other levels of inspection which are higher than a visual inspection. Uh, the first is called limited intrusive survey, uh, or a limited intrusive inspection, and that effectively involves prodding around in, inside the vessel um, and um, it's a hands-on approach to inspecting and testing uh, uh, the safety and status of a vessel. And then the highest level inspection of inspection um, that you can have on a vessel like this um, is called destructive testing. Now, um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what that is. Uh, it's essentially getting the vessel out of the water and banging around in a serious way to determine uh, where the sections are rotten and when that occurs, um, bits of the vessel are literally destroyed um, through that testing process. Now, um, just to go back through uh, the timeline of events here, um, I want to make a couple of things clear. The council report is a higher level of inspection. It is uh, limited intrusive inspection and also destructive testing. These are the two methods of testing that we have used. The Transdev report was purely a visual, a visual inspection. Um, so I think that gives an indication of uh, which reports are more thorough. Uh, this is why I made the comment uh, earlier that we made the right decision to get these ferries off the water. There was doubt raised. Um, that doubt was raised as a result of a more thorough testing and inspection process. Um, and uh, what we've seen since then is uh, Transdev provide uh, what is effectively the results of a visual inspection. I don't know about you, um, but I know which one I'd prefer to rely on. I'd prefer to rely on the higher level inspection that involved uh, limited intrusive inspection and destructive testing. So let's go through the timeline here. Uh, we have um, uh, some important uh, different, um, I guess, uh, developments that led us to the situation that we're in. So in April this year, um, Council commissioned a full transitional survey in preparation for Disability Discrimination Act upgrade works on the monohull ferries. I've mentioned this previously. Uh, this work was done on one vessel. Um, that vessel was the Gayanda. That's the name of the vessel. That was done by an independent um, uh, consultant. So that process was commissioned in April. Now in June, uh, we received a report that found evidence of timber rot in Gayanda and that it was possible or likely that this could extend across other timber hull ferries. 
Council then arranged to carry out further invasive investigation works on the hull to determine the extent of the rot. The invasive investigation involved removing the outer layers of timber to identify the extent of timber rot. What I can say is the outcome of that testing on Gayanda means that Gayanda is um, unserviceable. It is unable to be put back on the river because a portion of the hull was literally destroyed in that testing. Now that is concerning because it indicates a serious structural weakness in the hull. It indicates rot in that hull. And, and obviously this is something which um, sounded alarm bells uh, about the status or potential status of the other vessels. We then uh, engaged that consultant to do work on all of the other vessels as soon as we had those concerns raised. Um, and in July this year, uh, so just last month, uh, following the first vessel testing or the testing on Gayanda, um, we asked the consultant to do poke tests, which involves a sharp probe being inserted into the hull of the, the other wooden vessels. Now, there was one of the vessels that is a steel hulled vessel, which I mentioned before, um, and that was obviously uh, not undergoing the same level of testing for timber rot for obvious reasons. Uh, but the results of the poke tests um, came back and in, on the 10th of July, uh, the poke test says that each vessel inspected exhibited deterioration of the hull structure to varying degrees and extent of severity, such that in our opinion, we believe the integrity of the hull structure has been compromised and is now non-compliant with respect to its original approval. In our opinion, the required repairs are, are, are overdue and should be completed immediately. Now, obviously that was a concerning report and um, given the implications for the entire uh, vessel, uh, the entire monohull fleet, or particularly the timber vessels, council then uh, urgently and immediately sought a second opinion from another different uh, maritime surveyor. Uh, they then uh, provided to us on the 23rd of July um, the advice which led to the vessels being withdrawn from service. Um, so they moved very quickly and uh, in a short period of time, we acted on their advice and took the vessels out of service. Um, and so these documents have all been tabled. Um, so obviously councillors will take the time to go through them. Uh, but I think it is clear beyond a doubt that when you receive information with that kind of uh, concern raised in reports from not one, but two independent consultants, then you have to take action. You have to put safety first. And that is exactly what we did. Um, and so uh, the matter progressed. Uh, and as I said before, on the evening of the 23rd of July, um, we took the first two vessels off and the following day, we took all the remaining vessels off. And since then, we've been working to get to the bottom of the, um, the differing expert views on uh, or consultant views on um, just how bad the situation is uh, and whether these vessel, vessels um, are safe to go back on the water. I'm pleased to report, uh, as was indicated before, that we can get steel hull vessel back on the water and we're aiming for early next week. Uh, and that will service the Malimba and Tenerife Cross River run. Why have we chosen that? Uh, because it carries a large number of passengers. And obviously, uh, our priority here will be to put back the services that carry the largest number of people. Uh, that's what we've done with our CityCat services for Holman Street and Kangaroo Point. That's what we're doing for Belimba and Tenerife. And as further vessels become available, uh, we will make the right decision uh, to make sure that those vessels are allocated to where they can make the most difference and provide the highest level of service to the people of Brisbane. Uh, and so we have this situation now where there are three different consultants who have um, provided advice on our monohull ferries. Two of those consultants raise serious concerns about the safety uh, and structural integrity of the vessels. Uh, one of them says they're good to go with a few minor tweaks. Uh, two of those consultants have used a high level of inspection and testing. Uh, the intrusive, limited intrusive surveys or the destructive testing. Our two consultants have used those higher level inspections. The other consultant uh, engaged by the operator uh, has just done a visual inspection. Uh, and so- uh, Is it good, mate? Your time has expired. Move for an extension. 
An extension of time has been moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Landers. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Thank you. And those against say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, and so I, I do think, I am convinced, uh, I believe it uh, in my bone marrow that we made the right decision. Um, it was at the time taking an abundance of caution, uh, but as more and more information and evidence came to light, uh, it has been, our decision has been vindicated and justified. We cannot afford to put the people of Brisbane at risk on those ferries, and we cannot afford to put the staff uh, at risk on those ferries either. So we made the right decision, and we will get to the bottom of this, there is no doubt. Uh, this is a very serious matter, one that we are treating very seriously, and one that we will pursue vigorously. Uh, so, uh, obviously, in the meantime, we will continue to work to get uh, boats back on the water as they are safe to do so, but not before they are safe to do so. Sorry. 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 Councillor Cook? Um, would the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Lord Mayor. Uh, the question is, what implication, if any, will this have on transferring the monohull vessels to C-Link when the changeover of contract occurs? Lord Mayor. Okay, look, that is, that is a good question and, and a legitimate one. Thank you, Councillor Cook, for that question. Uh, obviously, um, the operator, which has the responsibility for the maintenance of these vessels uh, and has done for many years, also has the responsibility uh, to make sure that when they are handed over to the new operator, which they will be, uh, they are handed over in good, uh, in good nick, in good shape, and in a safe form. Now, we understand that these are 30-year-old plus vessels, so there's, there's going to be obvious wear and tear on the vessels, but we are talking about uh, the basic safety of the vessels and, and um, the type of safety that uh, is guaranteed by making sure that appropriate maintenance is done over the course of the contract. Now, what I can say, Councillor Cook, uh, is that um, the operator has a legal and financial obligation to do that. So uh, they must hand over those vessels uh, in good nick and we'll be ensuring that that happens. Uh, so hopefully that satisfies you. But uh, as I said, we'll be pursuing this uh, vigorously uh, to make sure that the, the vessels uh, are handed over in a good condition uh, and that the vessels will not return to service unless they are safe to do so. Uh, so I can also say that as part of the contract uh, that we have for operating uh, these vessels, there is a security bond on the operator. That security bond is to the tune, I understand, of $4 million. Now that $4 million helps us guarantee that the vessels are handed over in good shape. The operator would lose that security bond if there were any issues uh, with the assets that are to be handed over. Uh, so once again, that is uh, another surety that we uh, can make sure that once the transition of contractor occurs, that those, uh, those vessels are handed over in good nick and that council and the ratepayers of Brisbane are protected in that process as they rightly should, given that TransDev is responsible uh, under the contract for maintenance. So, uh, you know, I, as I said, Council Cook, good question and one that, that we are um, very uh, interested in ourselves and pursuing vigorously and we will continue to do so. Uh, but. I do think it is really important here um, to, to just stress that these sort of situations, which are very serious, we are talking about potential safety issues um, to the traveling public. We are talking about council assets here um, operating on the Brisbane River. Uh, and uh, we are talking about matters that um, involve uh, very serious consideration and, and are certainly not added to by party politics. But it is genuinely disappointing, Mr. Chair, that the opposition has chosen right from day one to try and play politics with this issue. Uh, this is a safety issue and we've treated it as a safety issue. But uh, right from the beginning, the opposition has been uh, causing mischief, trying to play politics with this issue uh, and certainly um, 
you know, trying to fan the flames uh, of conspiracy in the community. Uh, and that is absolutely unhelpful, Mr. Chair. I mean, you take, for example, on the on the day... The I point of order for you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would the Lord Mayor take another question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? Oh, I, no, I've taken Councillor Cook's question already. There's a lot to cover. Lord, in this Lord, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the day that the, it was announced that the ferries would be withdrawn from uh, service uh, out of the abundance of caution at the time, uh, Councillor Cook, uh, Mr. Chair, stood up on Channel 7 and claimed that the maintenance issues are not new and were known about prior to the election. Now, I don't know where she got that idea from because the tune has certainly changed since then. Um, you know, we've seen the union and various other people suggesting that there's no problem here, just put the boats back on the water. Yet on day one, she was claiming that there were maintenance issues prior to the election that were known about. Now, I've been through the timeline. The, the yes. first audit that the Lord Mayor just spoke Sorry. about earlier. What's that, Councillor Cook? I was just saying the first audit, Mr Chair, that the Lord Mayor referred to earlier for the DDA compliance. Not a point of order. That, that's probably appropriate for a speech later in the evening. Uh, Lord Mayor. Well, Councillor Cook's idea, Mr Chair, of timelines is very sketchy because the election was in March and the work that I talked about and the timeline I talked about didn't start until after the election. I, quite, I was quite clear that we asked in April for work to be done on one of the vessels uh, to uh, bring it up to disability uh, access compliance. That was the reason for the testing. Uh, there was never any concern about maintenance. It was simply, what do we need to do to this vessel to get it up to standard for disability access and compliance? That's why we commissioned the report. And then once that report was started in April and work was done, we discovered some very concerning things. And then the process, as I've outlined in the timeline, continued from that point on. So once again, yeah, Councillor Cook was, Mr Chair, um, shooting from the hip there on day one, suggesting that there were maintenance issues that we knew about before the election. False. I said you've known about it for months. You know, months. No, no, Councillor Cook. Please allow yeah. you heard silence. He's welcome to rewatch the interview. And then, uh, Mr Chair, on that same day, Councillor Cook slammed us for the decision to take the ferries out of action. Uh, and I quote, pulling these ferries from the water without warning is going to cause chaos for Brisbane commuters come Monday morning, she said. Uh, and that's her quote uh, in the Courier Mail on the 24th of July. Uh, and then uh, we saw on the 4th of August, Councillor Cook going on ABC radio, once again, fanning the flames of conspiracy, suggesting that it was a cost-saving measure that we'd pulled the vessels out of the water. Uh, the quote is, uh, I think it's a question for the Lord Mayor. Is it a cost-saving measure? Councillor Cook on ABC Radio. And then in that same period, same day, we had the Maritime Union of Australia representative saying, Transdev has told him that there are only a few minor issues with the vessels. The union says they shouldn't have never been taken off the water and there is little wrong with them. Now, it's interesting that, you know, the union is backing up a corporation in this way. You don't often see that happen. Why? You have to ask why. One could assume it's because there is an LNP administration in Brisbane City Council, because I've never seen a, a part oh, Mr. Chair. between a union and a corporation that's, like this. That's clearly, that's clearly impugning motive, and the Lord Mayor should take back those comments. I, I, I don't agree that... It it was. Um, uh, I think that the way that it was presented was not impugning my Lord Mayor. Well, actually, it's interesting that um, Councillor Cook raises this point because um, prior to that radio interview happening, um, I had this really strange thing happen in my office in City Hall. There was a gentleman who came to the front desk um, claiming that he was here for his meeting. And the person at the front desk said, okay, well, that's, well, I'll just check for you. What, what's your name? Where are you from? And, you know, what, what's the nature of the meeting? And um, so this is at the front desk of my office. And he said, I'm here for um, 
my meeting with Jared Cassidy. I'm from the Maritime Union of Australia. Oh. Now, I don't know what secret meetings were going on between the union and the Labor Party, uh, but the union has never asked to meet with me. They've never raised concerns with me. They have not Very made useless. contact with me about this matter, yet they're having secret meetings with the leader of the opposition in the lead-up to these public statements being made that there's nothing to see here. Uh, who really oh, runs the show down there? So uh, I really would question... It was hardly when, secret. ..when <laughs> Councillor Cook uh, talks about motives here and impugning motives. I, I wonder... I wonder what the motive was when a union official wants to meet with Councillor Cassidy, but not the Lord Mayor, to talk about the issue with the ferries. You'd think anyone who was genuinely wanting to get to the bottom of it would ask to, <coughs> excuse me, would ask to meet with the Lord Mayor. But no, interested in meeting with Councillor Cassidy, having a secret meeting uh, to talk their media strategy through for the following week. It's a big Abbey's conspiracy. Time. Um, so. Uh, look, it is really disappointing that they've chosen to behave this way, uh, but I put the blame solely at um, the Labor Party's feet here. Uh, they're no doubt the ones that called for the meeting with the MUA. Uh, I'm sure the MUA were just uh, being Lord summoned. Man, time has expired. Move for an extension. An extension. Yeah, give him one. This is great. The second. Uh, all those in favour of an extension, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Lower your hands. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cassidy protesteth too much. I'll come to you next, Councillor Cassidy. Let's have a look at your oh, contribution. Point of order uh, to you, Councillor Johnston. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, the Lord Mayor is continuing to directly address Councillor Cassidy um, and directly attack him. Um, yes. Fine, yes. but that's... <laughs> and we can't keep meeting in this environment because it is con it's contributing to the problem. So it. you must call it out, you must stop him, or we need to go back in the chamber where Maybe. it doesn't happen. Well, there's sort of two points you're making there, but I'll address the principal one. I'll address the minor one first. We'll return to the council meeting uh, as soon as we can, and that all uh, preparations have been made for our return short of the workplace health and safety concerns uh, raised by the CEO. And the, the principal one, all councillors will address their concerns excuse me, their comments towards the chair and address each other by title. Lord Mayor. Oh, Mr Chairman, look, I apologise uh, for the times when I, uh, it slips my attention um, to refer to councillors directly and uh, absolutely everything I'm saying is through you, Mr Chair, uh, and you are right. Uh, but through you to Councillor Cassidy, uh, let's have a look at Councillor Cassidy's contribution on this matter because while Councillor Cook has been exposed for fanning the flames of conspiracy, um, peddling uh, mistruths out there in the community, uh, her contribution pales into insignificance when it comes to Councillor Cassidy. Uh, because, Mr Chair, Councillor Cassidy, and I quote, said the following on social media. He, uh, he was referring to myself, uh, the Lord Mayor, pulled them from the water without warning a week ago and didn't tell the operator why. Fake news. Uh, we told the operator why. Uh, you don't pull all the vessels out of the water for no reason. Uh, you can be assured, Councillor Cassidy, we told the operator why. Uh, and then he went on to say, is it a secret plan to retire them? This is just kind of disgraceful speculation. He went on to say, this all seems so suspicious to people. Trams disappeared from Brisbane streets after a fire at the Paddington Depot. I hope this isn't the reason to pull these boats off the river. The Lord Mayor's response to this is extraordinary, end quote. Uh, who pulled the trams out of service? It wasn't the LNP, uh, Mr Chair. It was the Australian Labor Party who killed the trams in Brisbane. And I can tell you right now that we pulled these vessels off the water for legitimate safety reasons and today's reports will show that you have uh, you have a opposition with egg on their face, Mr. Chair. Egg on their face. They've been floating conspiracy theories around the place, sp spreading and peddling mistruths, uh, and it is just really a disappointing approach on a serious safety issue. Uh, and then back to Councillor Cook, Mr. Chair, on social media, she claimed that 
the Lord Mayor's lack of urgency is extremely worrying. And then this is the best line of all of them, Mr Chair. She claimed mistruths are circling about the Cross River Ferry situation. Let me repeat that. Mistruths are circling about the Cross River Ferry situation. Well, where are those mistruths coming from, Mr Chair? The Australian Labor Party and their union mates. That's where the mistruths are coming from. Uh, so we will continue, Mr Chair, to put residents' safety first. We will continue to act in the interests of the Brisbane residents and, in fact, the staff operating on those ferries, and we will continue uh, to make good, uh, responsible decisions when it comes to matters like this. This is why Labor cannot be trusted in administration, because it's always about politics. Forget safety. Forget anything else. It's about politics for them. But for us, we made the right decision, and it was the right decision based on safety. Uh, and we will get to the bottom of this, Mr Chair, and I will keep councillors up to date as more information arises. Uh, but Is that uh, all you've got? We are... <laughs> Talk about a wet lettuce. I know, Councillor Cassidy. Lord Mayor, please continue. Councillor Cassidy, Mr Chair, um, he really uh, is in this job I think for the wrong reasons, just to play politics, just to support his party colleagues. We saw last week uh, how he had all of question time to ask about uh, things like ferries and, and safety, yet he talked about an issue that relates to the state election um, in the seat of Aspley. Forget about the rest of Brisbane, forget about any other part of the city. He was only interested in the state seat of Aspley and uh, going into bat for his Labor colleagues in the state government uh, to try and peddle an issue. Now, obviously, you want to speak about wet lettuce leaves, Mr Chair. Um, that was uh, the classic example last week. But this is a very serious issue. Uh, it's not one, Councillor Cassidy, uh, to make light of. Uh, it's not one uh, to approach in the uh, very, uh, I guess, uh, unreasonable way that you've done um, peddling conspiracy theories and mistruths. Uh, this is a safety issue which which required a mature response uh, from an experienced team, and that is exactly what has happened here. Uh, and as I said, we will continue uh, to uh, do the right thing by the people of Brisbane. But I did uh, want to uh, provide credit to one particular um, uh, councillor here. Now, Councillor Shri, uh, Mr Chair, his residents have been impacted by this change, uh, probably more than any other councillor, in fact, in terms of the number of people. Um, but what has Councillor Shri said about this? Uh, he's taken a practical response, which is to try and get CityCat services, um, you know, restored in places like Holman Street. He supported our decision to do that. He claimed the credit for it. That's fine. We're used to Councillor Shri claiming the credit for good things that council does. Um, you know, it's, it's the basic uh, formula. Uh, good stuff is Councillor Shree, bad stuff, LMP administration and evil Lord Mayor, uh, end quote. Uh, but that's okay. I know how it works, Councillor Shree. Um, but good Councillor Shree... Yeah, claim to be misrepresented. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure that... In a purely motive. Not yet spoken today, and um, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that comment was, uh, was pretty wide. So, Lord Mayor. Uh, but but Councillor Shree's comment on social media, um, and I will quote, I understand the need to be extra cautious when it comes to safety. And he was referring to the decision that was made on the ferry services. Thank you, Councillor Shree. It is not often that you and I agree, uh, and is certainly not often that I can say that you're taking the sensible approach on an issue. Uh, but this one, thank you. And I pay tribute where tribute is due um, for the approach that you have taken. Because uh, in the end, we all want the same thing. Uh, or I thought we all wanted the same thing, uh, but uh, our approach will continue to be uh, one about safety first and then restoring services as soon as we can do so. Uh, but moving on, Mr Chair, uh, to some other issues. Uh, as I always do um, at the beginning of my report, I just wanted to talk about um, some of the uh, important community uh, days and events that are coming up and how we're working with community groups to support those days. Um, and in particular, it was a great honour to be with the RSL Queensland last night in King George Square for the switching on of a special projection on the side of City Hall to acknowledge 
the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, and in particular, the victory in the Pacific. Um, and so it was August, uh, the 15th of August, 1945, uh, that the, uh, the Japanese forces de uh, declared their unconditional surrender. Um, and, uh, or maybe it was the 14th of August and the 15th of August, the following day was victory in the Pacific day, which at the time the government declared as a public holiday, uh, and there was celebration in the streets of Brisbane. There was celebration all across, uh, the nation in every town, large and small. And in fact, this building during the war, um, it is obviously one of the buildings in Brisbane that was standing proudly during World War II. And this building was used for a range of different military purposes, including as a recruiting office. There were a range of military officers here in this building throughout the war. And as we know, um, Brisbane was the headquarters of the Southwest Pacific War effort with General Douglas MacArthur based here in Brisbane. Uh, his office in MacArthur Chambers is preserved as a museum. And he stayed uh, while he was here um, in uh, Queen Street Mall. Well, it wasn't a mall then. Um, uh, but he stayed here uh, throughout that period as, as his time uh, as commander of the Southwest Forces. So a very significant event, not only for Australia, but particularly for Brisbane, and one that uh, is appropriate we should pay tribute to. Uh, and so I encourage all councillors, uh, and if you're out and about this week, um, to have a look at the projection on City Hall. Um, it's not a static projection. It is literally uh, like a movie projected onto the side of City Hall. Um, with a whole range of historical images and, and a fantastic tribute to the war effort in Brisbane. But uh, in a, on a more sombre note, uh, on the side of the clock tower, um, or on the side of the building, uh, there is a rolling tribute to the more than 30,000 Australians who died uh, in the war, and their names are listed on the side of the building in a, in a rolling tribute. So uh, please do have a look at that uh, when you get the chance. Uh, on Thursday, uh, the Victoria Bridge and Story Bridge and Radcliffe Place uh, will be lit blue uh, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the uh, Republic of Korea National Liberation Day, uh, another 75th anniversary that we um, acknowledge. Um, uh, and uh, Friday marks the eve of India, Indian Independence Day and the Victoria and Story Bridges will be lit uh, orange, green and white in the Indian national colours. Uh, on Sunday, the Victoria Bridge, uh, Story Bridge, Sandgate Town Hall and Tropical Dome at the Botanic Gardens will be lit, lit purple and pink to celebrate Queensland Seniors Week. Lord uh, Mayor, your time has expired. Move for an extension. Extension time moved by Councillor Adams, second by Councillor Landers. All those in favour say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And those against say none, raise your hands. No, that's enough. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Thank you. And uh, it would also be remiss of me uh, on behalf of this organisation to acknowledge the devastation and tragedy that happened in Lebanon in the city of Beirut uh, in recent days. Uh, that absolute tragedy was no doubt shocking to all of us. And in this day and age where we live with um, lots of people filming what happened from different angles, uh, I'm still seeing every day incredible um, and shocking videos coming out of Beirut uh, of what happened there and what people went through and the devastation uh, that has, it has uh, caused to that city and that community uh, with incredible and countless numbers of people uh, now homeless, with the destruction of uh, virtually an entire city, uh, with damage so widespread across that city uh, that is just uh, almost impossible to imagine. And the size of that explosion was just like something I have never seen before. And, and so immediately on that day when the news broke, um, I uh, made the decision that we would light up uh, the Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge in the colours of the flag of Lebanon. Uh, and that occurred uh, just as a small but symbolic uh, gesture to the people of Lebanon that we are thinking of them and we are praying for them. Uh, and that while we may be on the other side of the world, we, they are very much at the forefront of our minds. And uh, obviously we, we're keen to see if there's anything that we can do as part of that recovery effort. But certainly in the meantime, our thoughts and prayers remain uh, with the people of Lebanon and Beirut, and particularly those local residents of Lebanese descent uh, 
uh, who may have relatives and family uh, back in Beirut as well. Um, our thoughts are with you. Uh, Mr. Chair, the items in front of us, uh, item A, we have the uh, audit committee report. Um, and uh, this uh, report we have seen uh, providing uh, that the audit committee received updates from the CEO, the CFO, the chief uh, internal auditor and the Queensland audit office. Uh, the latest audit committee meeting was held on the 9th of July, 2020. Uh, and this was the first audit committee meeting uh, with the new independent members um, that uh, we recently um, proposed through council. Uh, we'll continue um, to work with our audit committee to make sure that uh, issues are identified in council and responded to effectively. Um, and uh, this is obviously an important committee for the city and one that helps manage um, uh, the, the risk of this organisation going forward. Uh, item B is the land tenure arrangements for the Howard Smith Wharves Ferry Terminal. Uh, and I'm very proud that uh, we are continuing to upgrade our ferry network, whether it's investing in uh, new double-decker city cats, investing in upgrading existing terminals, or uh, in this case, building a new terminal uh, in an area of very high demand. Um, and so uh, we're progressing this project with a new state-of-the-art terminal at Howard Smith Wharves. Um, the uh, tender process to construct the tender includes um, preference for uh, local uh, benefits and also uh, is worth mentioning that um, we are having fabrication done uh, here locally as well of the, the steel work in those uh, ferry terminals. Now, <clears throat> that hasn't always been the case um, and for cost reasons in the past, uh, some of the fabrication was done offshore um, and that was a decision that was supported both by the federal and state governments in the past. And uh, when we were re rebuilding the ferry terminals after the 2011 flood, um, part of the work was done here locally and part was done offshore to keep the cost down. Uh, but going forward and given um, the economic situation that we're in, uh, this administration has made the decision that uh, local fabrication, while it will cost more, um, is a good thing to support local business in particular at this time and under these circumstances because that supports local jobs. Uh, so um, this particular uh, document <clears throat> relates to the um, uh, wet lease associated with the um, terminal and the, and the land tenure arrangements with that to help progress this, this matter and bring it to um, fruition. Uh, and finally, item C, the lease of the um, Centenary Community Hub. Um, Council's lease for the Centenary Community Hub located at um, uh, Mount Omni Shopping Centre, Dandenong Road. Uh, the lease is due to expire on the 30th of September this year. Um, the, lesser, the lessor or the property owner has offered Council a new six year lease over the existing premises commencing on the 1st of October. Uh, this is a really good location uh, in the Jamboree Ward. Um, and I know that Councillor Hutton has had a keen interest in the location uh, for the many community groups who use this site and benefit from it. Um, the hub is, key, is home to several key community organisations and service clubs, uh, plus entertainment and community project teams. Um, so uh, obviously this is something that I support and would uh, encourage our other councillors to support as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the uh, extensions of time as well. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes. Um, what about the information that I requested from the Lord Mayor? He's been going for about an hour, and it was a simple question about what the annual increases in the existing lease were. Yeah, yes. Um, the rules allow for questions to be asked of uh, movers of items, um, and the question was asked, um, and... Um, um, the Lord Mayor has an uh, opportunity to speak in the future and, um, and uh, if the information is available, I trust he'll provide it. Further speakers? He's been going so long he forgot it. Captain. Thanks, Chair. I think you've given me the call. Yes, I have. Didn't hear, sorry. Um, uh, I just asked at the outset that item A be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. Item A will be taken seriatim for voting purposes. Yes, thanks, Chair. I'll speak on 
um, all three of these items. It, um, it was great to finally hear the Lord Mayor um, talk about what was before us in ENC after spending uh, longer um, in the, during his four extensions talking about Councillor Cook and I uh, than about the business before Council, but I suppose that uh, goes to the kind of uh, leader he is here in this place, Chair. Um, on Clause A, the report of the Audit Committee, um, this is uh, for noting, as it is each and every time this comes, we, of course, support the need for an audit committee process and we, um, however, have significant concerns with the way in which the committee reports back to council and the secrecy where certain documents are kept from councillors and continue to raise these concerns about this secret committee. Uh, they're ones that we um, talk about each and every time and will continue to raise until they are addressed. We have the report before us, which is nothing but a brief summary of what was discussed at the committee meetings. Uh, there's no real detail about the issues and how they are impacting on council's operations. They're not proper minutes. Uh, they are um, just a, uh, not records of proceedings. They're um, broad minutes um, of what was discussed. We've been presented with the four-page document, um, uh, one page listed who attended and three pages of dot points about uh, some of those uh, vague items that were discussed. Chair, it touches very briefly on topics like risks due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, council's asset revaluation process and the fi a finance um, attestation project, but without any details of any kind um, of the risks that are associated with those three things. You would imagine, Chair, that uh, there would be significant risks um, to this organisation um, from COVID-19. Uh, it should be something that, that Council has been discussing at length at all levels of Council and continues to discuss, uh, but we wouldn't know that coming uh, from the Audit Committee and what risks they are presenting with Council because, again, none of that information is provided uh, to the elected councillors of the Brisbane City Council. I um, went up to level 23 again and inspected the files and, lo and behold, there is no additional information uh, kept on record um, that was presented to ENC or available for um, other councillors to look at. Uh, so we will not be supporting this item today, Chair. On Clause B, the Howard Smith Wolves land tenure arrangements. Um, it's seeking to approve uh, approval to accept the offers from the State Government's Department of Natural Resources and Mines for the Howard Smith Wolves Ferry Terminal uh, and for a commercial pontoon. Uh, this allows for the new um, uh, ferry and city cat terminal there. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting um, to note that um, all of the secrecy around um, the removal of the monohull ferries uh, and the continuing construction of um, uh, uh, pontoons and um, infrastructure for private water taxis um, to be operating on the Brisbane River. It doesn't take much for a punter to uh, piece all that together and uh, come to the conclusion that perhaps this administration uh, is looking to, in, in at some point, um, on their watch, uh, privatise ferry services chair. But specifically on the Howard Smith Wharves um, uh, project, we are already seeing delays on that. Um, we saw the announcement after announcement from the administration about the new ferry terminal, but uh, not one site has ever been turned on this site yet. Back in November 2018, uh, the then Deputy Mayor, Councillor Schroeder, announced Brisbane would be getting its 26th terminal for a cost of $12 million, which he said he expected the terminal to be open in 2020. Um, $9 million was coming from Brisbane City Council and $3 million from the Howard Smith Wharves. Last time I checked, we're in 2020 now, and I don't see an awful lot of work going on down at the Howard Smith Wharves terminal chair. You fast forward to today, August 2020, and the LNP is now only starting to sort out the lease of the land of which the ferry terminal is going to sit on. So not a single shovel has been put into the ground. Again, um, this project is being announced, um, but no work is happening on it. We will be supporting the item going forward, um, uh, but um, certainly hope that this project doesn't turn into another Kings of Smith Drive debacle with cost blowouts and huge delays. We've already seen the delays, and as the delays in planning this project, we certainly don't uh, hope we don't see the delays in the delivery um, of this project, Chair. Uh, on floor C, the lease of the premises for the Centenary Community Hub. Uh, this is to release, uh, uh, renew the lease, rather, on the building which is home to the uh, Centenary Community Hub, um, based at Mount Omni, the not-for-profit organisation that operates out of there. 
um, council's lease with the shopping centre expires at the end of September. Um, and as we see, the new lease will go uh, for the next six years uh, at a cost of $130,000 uh, plus $47,000, nearly $48,000 in outgoings. Um, the Centenary Community Hub, as we know, uh, is several to key community organisations and service clubs, plus various entertainment and community um, project teams. Since um, uh, the 5th of November 2011, this um, Centenary Community uh, Hub has been based in the building at the um, Centenary, uh, sorry, at the Mount Omni Shopping Centre. Um, it's a different story to many of um, the council community leases that we have. Uh, right across Brisbane, as Council doesn't own this building. Uh, in, in the vast majority of community leases, Council, of course, um, owns the building, doesn't pay rent on a private property. Um, it's an arrangement where um, yeah, Council is leasing directly from the shopping centre for the purposes of the community hub. So if anyone goes into the community hub, they obviously, of course, think that this is a Council site in which uh, the community hub is leasing uh, from them, which is the case, but they perhaps don't realise that uh, there is a significant ongoing cost here um, that if council had properly planned this from the start, uh, we perhaps would have had a publicly owned centenary community hub uh, by now. So the arrangement is unusual and not ideal, obviously, for the ratepayers of Brisbane, uh, but we're supporting a continuing lease to ensure that the community hub continues to have a home and, and continues to support the local community. But what is missing here, Chair, uh, is a plan to find a permanent home for the um, Centenary Community Hub not uh, continuing to lease um, a private um, building within a privately owned shopping centre um, in perpetuity. We don't see here the plan to get uh, ratepayers out of this arrangement into arrangement uh, where there is a genuine community hub out in the Centenary suburb. So we'll be supporting the item, uh, but do put on record um, the need for a, a genuine community space in those suburbs. Further speakers, uh, Councillor Landers. Point of order, Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. It's been moved by Councillor Landis, seconded by Councillor Hutton. This Council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the meeting. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Thank you. See you in 15 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, are there any further speakers on the ENC report? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak in support of item three, the lease of premise for the Centenary Community Hub. The Centenary Hub has a long history. For over two decades, the residents of the Centenary suburbs advocated for their own community centre. This vision became a reality on Saturday, the 5th of November, 2011, when the hub was officially opened by Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, Councillor Matthew Burke, and the Centenary Community Connections President, Linda Carnigan. The Centenary Community Hub is located opposite Mount Omni Shopping Centre and beside our council library. An excellent location, close to public transport and ensuring easy access for all residents. The two-storey complex has a variety of rooms from large areas suitable for seminars and functions to a number of smaller boardroom style spaces. Councillor Cassidy raised his concerns that it's not a council owned facility and we are paying commercial rent to the shopping centre. In program eight, of last year's budget, Councillor Berg had proposed to purchase the Salvation Army premises at Mount Middle Park. However, these negotiations fell through and the church decided not to sell. Fortunately, the Mount Omni Shopping Centre renegotiated with our council officers and have actually invested in the facility and have reduced the, reduced the rates. The centenary suburbs are quite established and finding a suitable location is challenging. This six year extension will provide us an adequate timeline to find alternatives while ensuring consistency for the community. The Centenary Community Hub is more popular than ever. There are more than 25 regular users of the facility each month, some meeting several times a week, including the Queensland Health Baby Clinic, Zumba, self-defense classes, craft workshops, podiatry clinics, Weight Watchers and St. John's Ambulance. Pre-COVID, I managed to visit the Centenary Women's Group who meet at the hub on a fortnightly basis. Over a cup of tea and some delightful lamingtons, this group aims to build a network to promote friendship, well-being, and social connectedness. During my visit, I met a lovely lady named Edith who re recently had discovered the group. We chatted and during the conversation, I asked her about the group and how she was enjoying it. She paused and I could see the emotion in her eyes. She pulled me close and said, this group has saved my life. I lost my husband of 55 years just three months ago and I've never been so lonely. These ladies have been so supportive, bringing me on a roster each week. They have really brought me back to life. As you can see, Mr. Chair, the Centenary Hub is more than just a facility. It has the power to change and shape lives, essential to creating and maintaining strong communities. The renewal of this lease is essential for the health, social wellbeing and economic prosperity of my community. I hope my fellow councillors support this motion. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise to speak on all three items uh, today. Just very briefly, um, as per usual, the audit committee meeting um, is completely inadequate um, particularly given the current uh, circumstances being faced by uh, Brisbane City Council and the financial challenges. Um, uh, I understand Council is uh, working on a new um, EBA with our staff and that's not going well. Um, the fact that it's appeared on um, this agenda is another indication of that. Um, and I'd certainly be hopeful that our staff are not going to um, um, get done over in this process, um, particularly when it comes to item C, I'll make that clear uh, why. Um, but with respect to item B, the Howard Smith Wharves um, and the ferry terminal, oh my God, this has been a debacle since it started. Um, we are bound, this is what the papers say before us today to anybody listening at home, we are bound to construct a new ferry terminal within lot 301, but we didn't have the land to do so. What kind of council enters into an agreement with somebody without um, the resources to deliver on that agreement? That locks us into these negotiations with the state government. We're now gonna fork out a ridiculous amount of money every year um, to do this. Um, it, it, this council has stopped acting in the interests of our city um, and stopped looking at the best 
possible uh, courses of action to deliver on um, improvements and services. Um, I, I just, I'm shocked. I'm just shocked um, that we now have to go and get all this land from the state government, pay them a truckload of money, pay for a pedestrian walkway. For goodness sake, there's all that riverfront down there. It was, it was a loading terminal before you turned it into um, the uh, precinct that it is, which has just been decimated by COVID. Um, before any of this happened, boats could pull up to that dock. I mean, surely in the first instance, making sure that we could economically and reasonably um, have a ferry terminal at the beginning would have been a good idea instead of trying to retrospectively jam it in and then paying the state government an absolute fortune so people can hop off the ferry and walk up a walkway. This council has lost the plot. These things are absolutely not being delivered in the interests of Brisbane residents. There's no value for money being sorted. There's no long-term planning going in. Um, <clears throat> and I'm extremely concerned um, at the way in which council has gone um, about delivering this. But that's not the worst item on the agenda today. It is item C. And I'll preface this by saying, I strongly support a uh, community hub for the centenary suburbs. Um, most uh, community centres have to pay their own rent. Um, most are on um, state government land or church land. They're not even entitled to a grant from this council to help them through COVID. Yet, the item before us today wants to renew for up to six years a lease for rental of $130,772 per year, uh, which is an increase on the existing lease of 1.4%. Now, the Lord Mayor has been unable to answer my question about what the inbuilt rates uh, rises to the uh, lease were in the existing agreement. Presumably, they're fairly similar to 3.5%. I do not know any single property owner in Brisbane today that would be expecting a 1.4% bump off the base and 3.5% increases per annum for the next six years. The problem with what this council is doing is um, they have just thrown their hands in the air and gone, we'll pay over, over um, the market value simply to keep this premises. That is not value for money. Council should have negotiated this rate down, not up. Do you know how many vacant buildings there are around Brisbane? If it's been nine years, Councillor Hutton, through you, Mr Chairman, Council's not looking that hard because there are a lot of them. It is absolutely unacceptable that in the first year of this lease, that is this year going forward, when the rest of the country is in dire economic circumstances, that Brisbane City Council is going to pay a private property owner a 5% increase on $130,772. That is outrageous. That is not reflective of market conditions. We haven't gone to the market. There's no other options presented to us here today. This is not value for money in any way, shape or form. This council should not simply be renewing a lease and ratcheting up the prices without testing the market for what other space is out there. Um, and the fact that this council has for the last nine years failed to do that, and as Councillor Hutton said, they'd been lobbying for a couple of decades before that, um, that is a very poor reflection upon council. But what I want to know is what council officer and um, the Lord Mayor and all the ENC chair people out there think it is reasonable for such massive leasing increases in a private property market that is absolutely in dire straits. And council needs to be looking for value for money and they are absolutely not doing this. This is a bad deal for the ratepayers of Brisbane. Brisbane City Council is paying way too much for the leasing of this site. Council should have taken this opportunity to renegotiate the lease 
not a 5% bump in the actual amount of the lease just this year, and then 3.5%, then 3.5%, then 3.5%, then 3.5%, and then 3.5%. That's what this council wants us to approve. That is unacceptable, and I will not be doing that today. And I'll go back to where I started. I strongly support um, a centenary community centre. Um, no other community centre in my ward gets their rent paid for them by council. Um, they don't, they're not, as I said, they're not even eligible for a grant. But this council has the obligation to use ratepayers' funds in the most economical and value for money way possible, and they are failing to do so. I, I, if, there's, if there is um, a um, uh, owner out there, a commercial property owner out there, um, who thinks they can get a 5% bump on their last lease in these current economic conditions, name them, name them. Um, because this is the most outrageous abuse of um, uh, council's bargaining power that I have seen in a very long time. There is no way we should be paying more for this. Um, council should have negotiated a better deal here if we're going to stay here. And better still, I agree with Councillor Cassidy, um, that council should have found permanent premises somewhere already. Council just spent $5 million at a giant skate park just up the road. Why on earth was no consideration given to um, a facility as part of that? That would have been a really good co-location. No, um, there's no other options here. With no other options, I'll say again, I support a community hub for the centenary suburbs. I do not support the way in which this lease has been negotiated and the terms upon which this lease has been negotiated. They do not reflect current economic conditions. They do not reflect value for money for the residents of Brisbane. And they lock Brisbane City Council into an up to six year contract with massive built in rent increases. And I can guarantee guarantee that in six years time we'll all be here approving another one and it's not okay for private property owners to be profiting out of um, this council at this time in our city's history our own staff didn't even get their pay rise and the lord mayor has said no you can't have a two percent pay rise yet he's perfectly happy for a property owner to get an up to five percent increase this year and then another five times 3.5% increases over the next five years. That is unacceptable. It shows he's prepared to prop up the private property market um, and not um, to spend this money in an economic way that reflects um, the current economic circumstances. I am completely appalled when I read this. I think it is absolutely disgusting. I note that the Lord Mayor has not even got back to me. And I bet um, these people have had 3.5% increases over the last six years or nine years of their, their lease every year. It's, it's enough. It needs to stop. And this council needs to be exercising its market power in a way that is reflective of the economic conditions of our city and in a way that offers value for money for the ratepayers of Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item C, the uh, Jamboree uh, Community Hub um, at uh, Mount Albany Shopping Centre. Mr. Chair, the residents of the centenary suburbs have been calling out for a community centre for years and years, as we've heard today. This lease is just the latest in an on again and off again decision for a purposely built community centre that residents have been demanding for as many years as I've been living in this area of Brisbane. When I heard that the Mount Albany Shopping Centre uh, were to require the space of the community hub to build a cinema complex, I thought, great, the residents will finally have a community centre built that they can call home. Councillor Burke at the time knew that he had a big issue on his hand in replacing it uh, and not replacing it would be a bit of a disaster, especially with the 2016 election looming. So he started the process in identifying a new location. And of course he put some money behind it. Well, this, this council put some money behind that as well. So kudos to him. So why am I raising this point of debate? If uh, we're about to sign a lease 
to give it uh, to give it back after losing it. Well, we can lose it once, but we can't really afford to lose it twice, because as it was said by Councilor Johnson in six years' time, yet yeah, we will be back here probably debating this uh, this premises again, Mr. Chair. The millions of dollars allocated for a new center should be reallocated as residents of the centenary suburbs deserve one and deserve a community center and not be at the mercy of a commercial decision. Mr. Chair, I'm a beneficiary of multiple community centers with council owned by council and community owned as well. I know the value of the services that these community centers can provide. The lease we debate here in the vote on today is only a short-term solution. And my fear is that uh, not in the not too distant future, it will be taken away again. I ask that the council through Councillor Hutton continue to pursue a purposely built community center for the centenary suburbs and the Jamboree Ward and not to drop the ball again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? I see no hands. The Lord Mayor. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak to item B, the land tenure arrangements for the Howard Smith Wars Ferry Terminal. I, um, I'd like to speak to the submission before us today for Councillor to take on uh, two 50-year wet leases and two reserves, which will allow us to get underway with this project. This team is all about building bigger and better river in infrastructure with a bold program of works, which will encourage public transport use on the Brisbane River. The Brisbane River, as we know, is one of the city's greatest natural assets, and it's one of our most important corridors and connectors. And we've spent a lot of time this morning discussing just how important transport on our river is. To echo the Lord Mayor's words, um, this is a really important project to boost the economy when our city needs it most. The new Howard Smith Wharves Terminal will provide uh, <clears throat> will provide an additional way to travel to the new newly developed precinct, which uh, under normal circumstances could see uh, approximately 10,000 visitors every single day. So a huge amount of traffic uh, coming through the Howard Smith Wharves. Now, um, the terminal will also provide extra connectivity, as we know, to the nearby New Farm Riverwalk and surrounding suburbs such as Fortitude Valley and Kangaroo Point via the Story Bridge. There were a number of factors uh, that were taken into location uh, in consideration when selecting the terminal location, which included accessibility, geotechnical engineering, and of course, uh, tidal conditions as well. Um, so the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy have offered council the following. Uh, a 50 year lease for the commercial pontoon based on the payment of annual rent with the rent uh, for the first year of the term being $71,225. And a 50 year uh, lease for the pedestrian walkway uh, access based on the payment of an annual rent with the rent for the first year of the term being $3,000. The creation of a new reserve for jetties and landing places for the ferry terminal with council being the trustee and the creation of a new reserve for jetties and landing places with council being uh, the trustee for the commercial pontoon. So um, the tender for construction of the Howard Smith Wharves ferry terminal uh, and of course South Bank is currently under uh, evaluation. These land tenure arrangements will allow for the creation of the two long-term leases for the provision of the future interlinked Howard Smith Wharves commercial pontoon located further upstream. And this will bring us closer to uh, constructing a fantastic piece of transport infrastructure with on-site construction estimated to commence later uh, this year. Uh, so now we had um, some honestly quite bizarre um, commentary from Councillor Johnson on this issue. Uh, and I just want to clarify uh, for the benefit of the chamber, because we know uh, that sometimes when she comes in here and says things uh, that it's not quite the whole picture, or indeed sometimes it's quite misleading. Uh, so yes, there is a commercial rent that is uh, that, that, that part of the commercial lease here attracts. That commercial rent only comes into effect when Howard Smith Wharves decide to construct the commercial pontoon uh, that is part of this project in addition to the ferry terminal. 
Um, so they have until 2024 to exercise that option under the wet lease and uh, council will not be paying that until such a time as they decide to take up that option. And you can understand uh, with Howard Smith Wharves being the way uh, that it is at the moment with a very significantly reduced uh, patronage due to COVID-19, why they might not be taking up the opportunity to build a commercial uh, pontoon in their uh, lease. So council will not be paying any uh, of that rent until such uh, a time as they take up that lease. And when uh, we do pay that rent, we will be recouping it from Howard Smith Wharves. So ratepayers will not be out of pocket as a result uh, of this wet lease. Um, but the end part of Councillor Johnson's statement was all about um, supporting uh, supporting the city during this difficult time. And I would say that there is probably no uh, better way that we could support one of the city's most thriving uh, retail and restauranting precincts uh, than building a new ferry terminal for uh, tourists and the, the travelling public here in Brisbane to be able to access uh, what is one of the new world-class precincts that this administration has created uh, through development along the riverfront there. And we uh, have heard uh, from the Deputy Mayor about just how important the Brisbane riverfront is to economic development. Uh, we know that Labor have never supported Howard Smith Wharves. Uh, they have voted against it. I believe uh, Councillor Johnson voted against it. So we know that when it comes to Howard Smith Wharves and enabling uh, that that area for recreation, for tourism, for job creation, uh, there's only one side of the chamber that supports it because those opposite have always been against anything and everything at Howard Smith Wharves. And from what I see today, nothing has changed in that regard. Thank you very much, Chair. I support the motion. Further speakers, Councillor Allen. Point of order, Mr Chair. Can I, take, um, I, can I take item C? Um, for seriatim purposes. Item C, seriatim for voting. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I joined the debate to uh, speak briefly on item C, the uh, lease of premises for the Centenary Community Hub. And uh, really just to uh, reflect on the comments that uh, Councillor Cassidy and Strunk have made, um, very measured and, and reasonable observations. I can attest to the fact that uh, in an ideal world, we'd love to have been able to secure a, uh, a site for the uh, Centenary Community Hub. Um, you know, certainly it's something that both Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk have, uh, have reflected on. Um, they fortunately weren't shocked and outraged as the Councillor for Tennyson was. But at any rate, the considerations that we have when looking for a potential replacement site for this facility include things like the location, the size of the site, the zoning of the site, the accessibility for the community. So there are a lot of factors at play here in terms of trying to find an appropriate site. It's not just like buying a house or a unit. It's a very specialized kind of an acquisition. Um, as Councillor Hutton indicated, we did believe that we had a site um, secured, or certainly we felt very strongly that we had a site secured. Um, however, negotiations uh, didn't come to a conclusion because the uh, vendor chose to retain the site. And so we're back in the marketplace again, looking for a suitable site. Now, I would highlight the fact they're just not there. And uh, we do need to be conscious that in securing a site, it needs to tick a number of boxes and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? I see no further speakers, the Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor declines um, the right of reply. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of item A, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. All those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. By Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk, please ring the bells. Councillors, those in favour of the resolution of the adoption of item A, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 
I Please lower your hands and those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that maybe. Oh. No. Thank you, councillors. Please lower your hands. Clarks, when you're ready, please read the result. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and five against. The ayes have it. Now, uh, councillors, in relation to item B, all those in favour of the adoption of item B, please uh, say aye and raise your hand. Oh. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against item B, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Vision, Chair. Vision called by Councillor Murphy. And Councillor Howard, please ring the bells. <laughs> Councillors, and all, all those in favour of the adoption of item B, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Uh, aye. See, this is a quick count. Keep offering him that because... No, thank you, councillors. Please lower your hands. Clarks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour. Who's missing? Thank you, the ayes have it. And now on item C, uh, all those in favour of item C, please raise your hand uh, and say aye. 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 Thank you. Please lower your hand. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Hutton. And Councillor Landers, please ring the bells. <laughs> Councillors, all those in favour of item C, resolution C, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that maybe- aye. Aye. Thank you, councillors. Please lower your hands. Clerks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 25 in favour. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. I'll now uh, draw your attention to the City Planning Committee, please. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Second that. Been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hammond, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And last week we saw a presentation by Peter Harwood, Manager of Development Services, just explaining about all the hard work that they've been doing as we've been working through the uncertain circumstances that we have with economic stability in Brisbane at the moment, what they're doing to maintain development services and what we're doing to make sure that the building and construction industry stays strong so we can have a strong economy and money in the pockets of our local residents going forward. 
So we know, as, uh, as I said, we've been trying to maintain our development services and make sure that the industry can continue. We have changed to many online pre-lodgement meetings since March. We've got new virtual plumbing inspections and we have uh, commenced transmission of electronic survey plans and times where you can pick up and drop off to make it a little bit easier as well. We have reduced our application fees, particularly for our small to medium businesses, which aligns with home builders grants that are being uh, presented by the federal government. So new dwelling houses or uh, extensions to dwelling houses that are not mine or home-based businesses. So they are, they've got free for domestic development until July uh, 30, from July 30 to 30th of September. July 1st to 30th of September, sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, with 50% discount after that um, on to December. We've also got a new express service, open door pre-lodgement, where you can come in and talk to planning services uh, around up to three uh, issues that you may have with the application that you'd like to present to council. Again, free until the 30th of September with a 50% discount after that until the 30, 31st of December. We also continue our free lodgement for applications that are eligible on behalf of charitable and non-for-profit organisations as well. We have introduced a dedicated 133 plan number. So 133 PLAN is the building and construction hotline. So this is for customers that are already out there on the ground, doing their work, getting their construction done, making sure the tradies are getting their business and their money being paid and they need some clarification or a way forward where we will turn around inquiries within one business day. The idea there is to keep our shovel ready development progressing so we can keep our tradies in work. We're looking at different applications around change applications and prioritising those. So we again make sure that people, if they're shovel ready, can address any issues they may have based on new circumstances and continue to employ the building and construction industry to get that work done. Our new house and homes assessment team have been doing amazing work there and completed 34 out of 67 lodged application within that 20 business day KPI. So the team have been working very, very hard to make sure that our building and construction industry continues to support the jobs that we need out on the ground um, going forward for the economic recovery of Brisbane. It is our most important industry and it affects everybody from the applicants right down to the mums and dads and the tradies in the suburbs, making sure they're supporting those local um, small to medium enterprises as well. We also had a petition requesting a rejection of proposed development at 55. Um, 7 to 571 Old Cleveland Road and 5 Princess Street, Camp Hill. Uh, that petition's main concerns were the same concerns that had been reflected by council officers in the request for information about the height and the density of the development, not keeping in character with the surrounding area and traffic impacts on the local network. So it was within centre. It is a generally appropriate use for this site, but uh, what we saw was probably a little bit too high density and not in character with the surrounding areas. So we will be working uh, with the applicant to uh, with the independent council officers on assessing that. There was 110 submissions, so it is clear that residents want to see a change in this application and it remains under assessment at this point of time. All of the submitters, of course, will have their, um, their ideas and their um, concerns factored into the decision making on this process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Chair. So I wish to speak on item B, which relates to a development application for a five-storey mixed-use development on the corner of Old Cleveland Road and Princess Street at Camp Hill in my ward. Well before this petition was started, I'd been in discussions with Camp Hill residents about the development, hearing their concerns about what had been proposed. I also wrote to residents in surrounding streets to share my concerns and provide details to allow them to make formal submissions to Council. I note that Council's planning officers raised a number of matters with the applicant in their information request in September last year, calling the proposed development an overdevelopment of the site and requiring, requiring a considerable redesign of height, scale and built form. While there have been changes to the proposed development, including a slight reduction in height and, a number of, and the number of apartments, 
I, along with other local residents, still have concerns. The proposed building is bulky and the design doesn't reflect the aesthetics of the Camp Hill area. The new dwellings would put extra pressure on streets like Princess Street. Contrary to the opposition's rhetoric, neither I as local councillor nor councillor Adams as planning chair have, ha have a green and red pen to approve or not approve particular DAs. It is an independent process following legislation. The application is currently being assessed by Council's Development Services against the requirements of the City Plan and in accordance with the Planning Act. As the petition response sets out, the matters raised by all submitters and petitioners will be carefully considered by Council officers as part of the assessment process. So I commend the petition response to the Chamber. Further speakers? I see no hands. Councillor Adams? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. You and those against say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Council of the Public and Active Transport Committee, please. Thanks very much, Chair. I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee a meeting dated the 4th of August 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Oh, Second. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Owen, the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting at a Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Murphy? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Look, before I get to the uh, committee report, can I just um, uh, discuss a question on notice which was provided to Councillor Griffiths last week? So. Um, last week, Councillor Griffiths had a question on notice regarding the Better Bikeways for Brisbane uh, program spend from 2016 to 2020. Um, and there were a couple of issues in there I'd just like to clarify. So um, there were two figures uh, that were wrong. Now, it doesn't affect the total spend, but it does affect the uh, breakdown of the spend. So the spreadsheet that was provided to Councillor Griffiths incorrectly stated that $350,000 went towards uh, the Mab Street to Paley Street project in 2017, uh, which is inaccurate. Works were undertaken to design uh, a bikeway link at a cost of $81,000 only. This pathway is still uh, in the planning phase. So it didn't take long for Council's enthusiastic cycling community to pick up on that one. And uh, of course, the $81,000 involved a feasibility investigation and an options analysis. A concept design was developed on the preferred alignment um, and we did commence preliminary design, but it never progressed uh, beyond that. Uh, in regard to the figure that was incorrectly included, the difference actually went towards uh, enhancing bikeways through banana bar removals, signage and network planning, with the total bikeway spend remaining unchanged. Then, of course, there was uh, the Stafford City and Royal Parade lighting. Um, this one was a cracker. So the spreadsheet provided uh, to Councillor Griffiths incorrectly stated that $1.5 million went towards lighting uh, the existing bikeway between Stafford City and Royal Parade uh, in 2017, which uh, again is inaccurate. This was uh, another honest mistake. The, the total actual uh, cost of this project was uh, $81,000 to light 365 metres of bikeway. Uh, bikeway. So in regard to the figure that was incorrectly included, this is actually um, money that went towards enhancing bikeways with the total bikeway spend remaining the same. So I apologise for the error. And of course, I uh, will provide Councillor Griffiths with uh, that updated record of project spend within that area. Uh, so, uh, Chair, thank you. For Monday this week, the state government uh, extended the shoulder of peak period travel, um, and that's what the committee presentation was about. So for the morning peak, it now finishes an hour later at 10 a.m. And for the afternoon peak, it now finishes at 7 p.m. Also uh, an hour later to provide a greater opportunity for passengers to stagger their uh, start and finish times. The reasoning behind this is in response to uh, what has clearly been changes in travel behaviour for commuters going to and from the workplace throughout the pandemic and to encourage social distancing. And that's what the committee heard all about. So for council, this means an additional 170 trips on 20 routes each weekday involving a range of buzz and rocket services. And this is currently scheduled to end on the 11th of December later this year, although that 
uh, date, I'm sure, will be subject to the vagaries of the pandemic and the evolving public health situation which we have. At committee, there were many interesting statistics that are emerging with bus patronage uh, plummeting in March and bottoming out in April with 14.89% of normal levels in week four of the pandemic, which, uh, which was for the week ending the 10th of April. School from home, uh, universities moving to online lectures and assessment combined with working from home for everyone except essential workers uh, reduced demand significantly during peak times. So from April, the presentation showed that patronage has been climbing with um, 5,086 uh, percent of normal patronage in mid-July uh, up. That was that was up uh, from the week starting the uh, 18th of July, which was when universities started to return to on-site campus activities, and there was a gradual return uh, to workplaces in line with easing of restrictions by the state government. So some routes up by uh, an enormous percentage. In terms of the dwell time for buses, the morning peak showed that services ran late, often uh, more than two minutes, with certain trips taking an extra uh, nine to 11 minutes. In terms of dwell time uh, for buses, the morning peak showed that services ran late, often uh, more than three to four minutes. And again, like with the morning peak, certain trips were taking an extra uh, nine to 11 minutes. The committee presentation also looked at the impacts of the state government's Cross River Rail project on Roma Street with the closure of the Inner Northern Busway uh, still underway. The Inner Northern, Bu Inner Northern Busway carries around 2,000 bus services each day. And as part of closing the busway, all bus services have been diverted onto Roma Street. No doubt councillors trying to get into King George Square car park are aware uh, of this. Temporary bus stops have been provided on Roma Street to replace the Roma Street bus station platform starting from the 18th of May. And um, this is scheduled to stay in place for the remainder of this month. Now, this is a major interchange point for our city's network with north, south, east and west services affected, including 43 urban routes and four district services affected and uh, just over 2,300 trips each weekday affected. So that's a lot of buses. Uh, Council has been working with uh, TransLink, the Cross River Rail site contractors and uh, Cross River Rail Delivery Authority to monitor how passengers are moving around the sites. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the closure was anticipated to have significant network impacts. Those impacts anticipated to be an increase in running times up to seven minutes for most services and for some services, nine to 11 minutes, as I said before. Um, requiring an extra 23 peak vehicles and approximately 40 full-time drivers. Due to COVID-19, traffic has operated at much lower levels than normal and expected. And while diversions have increased running times, uh, we have managed to do this without revising timetables with just one additional uh, vehicle in peak required. Because of diversions uh, from being on a grade separated busway to general traffic, uh, environment. The impacts mean a longer distance and increased congestion with a 40% increase in the morning peak running times and a 60% increase in afternoon peak running times as well as, well as additional uh, deadhead time for terminating services. So in terms of public uh, transport patronage, approximately 28,000 passengers per day uh, where travelling is approximately 38% of last year's patronage. And in terms of bus travel times for the AM peak, it's been uh, two minutes and 12 seconds longer than 2019 and in the PM peak, uh, two minutes and 58 seconds longer than in 2019. In contrast, in terms of general traffic for peak hour at Roma Street and Countess Street intersections, the peak showed 4,400 vehicles and 3,800 vehicles per hour. So 93 and 98% of last year respectively. So we're almost back. The presentation also highlighted what mitigation measures are in place in response to the pandemic, including, including uh, sanitizer at all the rail stations that are at a uh, large number of bus stations, including the Cultural Centre and the King George Square uh, bus stations, particularly where there's contact with furniture. So I want to thank uh, Greg Spellman for his informative presentation. I wanted to acknowledge again my appreciation for all the bus drivers working very hard at our depots and garages for their work in ensuring that passengers can continue to move throughout our, our bus network despite the pandemic. Um, at committee, we had one presentation with uh, 380 and 383 specifically signatures. The petition requested uh, more space for people walking, jogging and riding bicycles in response to the increased volume of people out and about enjoying our city during the pandemic. Um, the response is, uh, is as 
uh, as is there in the report. Um, I don't propose to uh, re-enter it into uh, the chamber today, um, but I'm happy to uh, take any feedback from any councillors in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, speak on, I'll speak on both of these items tonight and just ask that they be taken seriatim for voting. So um, each item separately, please. Um, on uh, clause A, the presentation about the bus network performance during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I have a few um, comments to make uh, on this and particularly the way in which um, uh, and congratulate uh, our Transport for Brisbane staff for the work that they've been doing in uh, keeping, um, at the time, essential workers uh, moving around our city uh, and increasingly so as we uh, emerge from restrictions of people taking to public transport uh, once again. Uh, but they have, have continued to face challenges, uh, Chair, our bus drivers while at work. Uh, and I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight some of those issues uh, for all councillors. So um, attacks on bus drivers have been, uh, by members of the public, um, have been down during COVID-19, but they are still occurring. And what is uh, becoming increasingly concerning is uh, behaviours uh, in, uh, like spitting are increasing and incidences of spitting are increasing on our bus drivers. Before the pandemic, a physical assault a week was commonplace. Um, bus drivers certainly shouldn't be coming to work expecting to be abused and assaulted. So any reports of this type of behaviour is um, very concerning, and I'm sure it would be to all councillors. Uh, initiatives made by TransLink, including rear door boarding and cashless payments, have, and um, by all reports, um, uh, reduce the interaction between, obviously, reduce the interaction between commuters and drivers, but also made it safer for drivers um, throughout this period. So we would certainly um, uh, renew our calls um, for more to be done um, by council to protect bus drivers while they are at work, Chair. So unlike tram and train drivers, of course, uh, bus drivers are um, uh, not uh, completely separated um, from commuters um, and they do remain vulnerable. That's just the, the matter of fact. Um, tram drivers on um, the Gold Coast, train drivers on uh, the QR network and um, drivers on the new banana buses will be separated from, uh, from commuters, but the bus drivers on our um, ordinary buses remain, uh, remain vulnerable. So the benefits of rear door boarding as a safety measure for bus drivers um, show how um, council could be taking the opportunity to ensure that there is um, an easier way potentially of full encapsulation for bus drivers in the design of um, new buses in the new bus build contract. And we'd certainly hope that council would take uh, learnings from uh, this uh, COVID period in the way in which our buses are operating um, forward and in the discussions that are ha um, had with TransLink about the way in which we operate our buses. Uh, on the issue of face masks, it's not a requirement uh, yet in Queensland, we certainly hope it won't be, um, uh, given the uh, fantastic job that uh, the Premier has been doing in keeping us all uh, safe and well up here in Queensland. Uh, but some bus drivers are preferring to use the face mask at the moment to protect themselves and their families. Um, they may have elderly parents or loved ones or maybe um, elderly or immune compromised themselves, some dealing with uh, cancer treatment and things like that. So we want to make sure it's as safe as possible um, uh, so um, something we would like to know is that whether Council has adequate stockpiles um, of face masks. We realise that a lot of that stock um, all around the country is going to Victoria, um, but we just want to make sure that our bus drivers are, uh, are well protected uh, in the event something does happen. Uh, on the issue of pandemic leave for uh, bus operators, we know that 560 bus drivers are casuals uh, if they need to get tested. Uh, for COVID or test positive uh, in that event, they can be off work um, for a couple of weeks without wages. Uh, so council should definitely be looking after these drivers and make sure uh, that they have adequate access to pandemic leave. Uh, and I'll leave those uh, comments with uh, the administration. Um, on clause B, uh, the petition, um, we'll be supporting the petitioner's uh, chair, but don't support the response to them. It does lack any substance uh, there has been a noticeable uptake, as we've discussed previously, in cycling and walking during uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. The bike store sales have been at a record high. Um, driving past them, you could literally see people lining up to make a purchase over the last couple of months. It's now been two months since this administration told Brisbane residents that it would be installing pop-up bike lanes and investigating an active transport grid in the city, 
a permanent grid in the city. The perfect opportunity to execute these mobility projects was during the COVID-19 lockdown when the city was quiet and uh, it, it probably never will be that quiet again. It was a golden opportunity that was missed by this Lord Mayor administration. When you compare what the Sydney City Council um, uh, announced at the time back in May, uh, they announced six uh, cycling pop-up projects and they have completed two of those already. Here in Brisbane, one was announced uh, and none have been completed. Um, so we, the, the petition response before us today tells petitioners nothing um, other than what we already know. Uh, they, it, the response mentions works to be done on um, cycle and pedestrian pathways uh, is just about 50 markings to encourage users to share the path. Um, this shows, I think, how little work has been done, Chair, uh, in planning for uh, a post-COVID future of um, mobility here in Brisbane. While, while the administration um, hardly lifted a finger in the public and active transport uh, space, Chair, uh, our team has been on the ground proactively engaging with transport stakeholders, uh, stakeholders like the RECQ, Space for Cycling, Bicycle Queensland and Queensland Walks. Uh, and we've been having a discussion with them about how um, to get our um, city actively moving. In those meetings, we discussed the need for upgraded pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and the missing links in our suburbs, the exact sort of thing uh, that this petition um, is, is crying out for, uh, but the thing that is not being delivered in the response or in the actions taken by this administration. Simple things like uh, pram ramp, cycling and pedestrian separation lines and pathway extensions um, are all needed. Um, all these projects, those simple ones, should have been completed along with pop-up bike lanes during the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so we welcome the petition and the advocacy by the community on this, but it should not have been needed. Um, if this administration was proactive and they were wise in using uh, the residents' money and governing uh, on behalf of the people of Brisbane wouldn't have to have, uh, people wouldn't have to go to such lengths to ask for um, pretty simple infrastructure like better cycling and pedestrian facilities uh, here in Brisbane. So we won't be supporting um, this petition response chair. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Joe. I rise to speak primarily on item A and just expand a little bit on the comments I made in, or the question I posed to the Lord Mayor earlier. We've, we've hit, heard a lot in the committee presentation about the impact that COVID and the shutdown has had on bus patronage and the challenges of particularly managing a network where we're also trying to provide safe distancing. And in the committee presentation, we heard from council officers that a, a positive outcome would be if we were able to shift some of the existing peak hour commuter load into off-peak periods. The characteristics of Brisbane's network historically and even currently are that we tend to have quite high demand in peak periods and very, very low comparative demand in off-peak periods except for a few school routes, etc. And so as a result, we're running buses that are near capacity or sometimes over capacity in peak periods and then well below capacity outside those um, times. So obviously there's there's a real benefit there if we can shift people, some commuters to off-peak periods in general, but particularly during COVID-19 and the desire to space things out a bit more, there'd, there'd be a lot of benefits to encouraging that, that transition out of the peak periods. On top of that, of course, we're now seeing a big decline in um, public transport patronage and that will hopefully recover and a little bit more, but I think it's a fair assumption or, uh, that it may not recover to the levels we saw before the pandemic for a range of reasons. One of those being the economic impacts of COVID and the fact that people will be avoiding uh, discretionary public transport trips simply to save money, but also just because the, um, there's still some generalised concerns about public transport and, and gathering in close confined spaces. So. What I'm proposing that the council administration seriously consider, and I'm not sure if the mayor is currently listening in or not, but I, I do hope that he will explore raising this seriously with um, the transport minister as well, is that it might not be as expensive as we think to offer free off-peak pub, off public transport to everyone. We already offer free off-peak public transport to seniors. Um, and we know that there's a lot of latent capacity on our services at the moment. So making 
uh, off-peak services free would not necessarily require us to put more services on. It would simply result in more efficient use of existing services that are already running. Uh, we know that in order to negotiate free off-peak travel for seniors, the council had to pay the state government a, a sum in terms of foregone revenue. I believe the figure was around $4 million for the, for the year. Um, but now, obviously, there's significantly less revenue coming in from those off-peak journeys due to the drop in patronage. And there might be an opening for this council to approach the state government and say, look, you guys want more people on your buses and, and trains, so, so do we. Uh, can we negotiate some arrangement where we can make public transport free off peak for everyone, even if it's only for a limited time, even if it's only a six month or one year trial to help stimulate an economic recovery, noting that if people can travel around freely, they're more likely to access local destinations, shops, businesses, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what we saw with free off peak travel for seniors. We did see that seniors were getting out more, engaging with their community more. And so it would seem to me that the likely benefits in terms of the city as a whole of making off-peak public transport free might actually justify the slight hit to revenue. And so at the very least, I'm hoping that Councillor Murphy can make inquiries as to what the projected loss in revenue might be if we were to uh, make public tra transport or at least buses and ferries free off-peak for everyone. I think the figure I heard previously prior to COVID was 80 million a year, which was obviously quite high, but um, it'd be interesting to know whether those projections of lost fare revenue or foregone revenue would be a lot lower now. I expect they would be. So if we can get some updated figures on roughly how much revenue would we have to forego per month, for example, or would the state government have to forego for per month if um, buses were free off peak? then we have a basis to start negotiating with the state government, particularly in the lead up to the state election. We know the state government will be looking for things to announce. Um, we know that making stuff free is a really good way to um, win votes. So they're gonna be really open to ideas like this at the moment. Um, and certainly I think it's a space that council should be playing in where we're generating these ideas and taking to them to the minister. I took the Lord Mayor's point about uh, the challenges of potentially subsidizing transport uh, from people who live in other re council regions, in other council areas. But uh, it's also worth recognising that if we make it easy and cheap or free to travel in, in and out of the Brisbane council area, that's generating more potential commerce and, and revenue for local businesses within our council, so within our city. So we want people to be coming in, into Brisbane to spend money. We want them to be moving around the city as more, more and we want to be encouraging a a general reactivation of the city and the public realm in as, as we emerge from the shutdown. So it would seem to me that even as a short-term trial, there'd be quite a lot of benefits in terms of making off-peak tra transport free. And so I hope Councillor Murphy and the Lord Mayor will take that idea seriously. Um, I'm, I'm not throwing it out there as, as some sort of wild ambit claim. I think it is genuinely a good idea and I don't think it would cost the city as much as we, we expect it might. So hopefully the administration will keep, can take that in good faith and consider it seriously. Thanks. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Murphy. Murphy. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chair. I, um, I just wanted to uh, address a couple of issues that were raised uh, by uh, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Shri uh, in the rebuttal. So first of all, um, to Councillor Cassidy, raised some issues uh, around the the CBD bike trial, and uh, you know I've, I've said this publicly. Perhaps um, pop up was definitely the, the wrong word uh, to describe uh, the CBD uh, the CityLink cycleway or the CBD bike uh, bikeway grid that we are uh, designing at the moment, because it certainly uh, isn't uh, pop up infrastructure. Now. Um, the reality is that this trial is going to bring some very significant modifications to roads uh, in our city centre and everybody in council wants to make sure that we get this initiative right. We want to make sure that these designs uh, are safe for cyclists. So council's presented uh, plans for, uh, for this grid uh, to bicycle user groups at the first active travel advisory committee, which was uh, uh, last month, and it took on 
their feedback, which is great to receive. And we've continued to receive uh, feedback from them. I know uh, that just last week, the Metro team uh, met with the uh, bicycle user groups to discuss the design of the inner city uh, uh, bikeway network. Um, there's also a matter of several critical approvals that are required from the state government before we make these changes. So there's actually five uh, approvals I've written off to Minister Bailey uh, to ask for those approvals to be fast tracked so we can get this uh, uh, this initiative happening sooner rather than later. Um, he has um, very generously written back to me uh, within only a couple of days, which is very good, um, suggesting that we get together a, a joint task force. Uh, to handle it. I'm always wary of uh, task forces and um, I suppose that propensity to continue to create process rather than outcomes, but um, I'm taking him at good faith here that we will be able to get those issues resolved um, very quickly so that we can see uh, this, uh, this inner city CBD bike grid uh, established. And once uh, those issues are sorted out, we'll be able to share more information on the timing uh, and delivery of this project. But I just want to say, um, in terms of uh, you know pop-ups in Sydney, uh, some of the uh, the pop-up bikeways in Sydney have proven to be very deeply unpopular uh, with local residents uh, that that they uh, are near, and uh, the city of Sydney has actually gone and pulled them out as a result of that. So the last thing we want to do is to uh, set up set ourselves up for failure here, where we go and we put all this pop-up infrastructure in, uh, people use it for a couple of months, uh, residents. Uh, other road users uh, get mightily upset at the um, sort of slapshod nature of it and then tear it down. So um, does that mean that we're probably committing ourselves uh, to uh, permanent cycling lanes in the CBD in the foreseeable future? Um, well, I'd say it's a trial, but certainly it is um, it is it is far more toward, towards the permanent end than, than a pop-up end. Um, we want this to be successful. We don't want it to be uh, something that that fails and then that we have to uh, withdraw it. Um, Councillor Cassidy also made uh, some comments around uh, driver safety and uh, the barriers. And look, I, I would welcome any uh, further consultation from the RTBU uh, when it comes to driver protection barriers. You know that councils undertaking consultation with drivers uh, on three types of barriers, the wide, the narrow and the partial barriers. Um, the wide barrier was removed from uh, the trial following two months of driver feedback about how uh, it performed very poorly. The two remaining barrier types were continued to be trialled and the um, partial barrier, which offered the greatest degree of, of um, protection but received significant negative comment from the operators around glare and other issues, uh, and including the visibility at night, that was um, removed. And then we have gone ahead uh, with the narrow barrier that received the the best feedback uh, from drivers. And that's now retrofitted on uh, 1,234 uh, buses. And we've been really uh, pleased to partner with the state government to deliver uh, that very significant real improvement uh, to the safety of our bus operators, a workforce that we care very deeply about and we wanna make sure um, that they are protected and that the risk uh, that they have when they come to their workplace is reduced as much as possible. So. Um, it's not only driver protection barriers, but we've also been implementing uh, CCTV, the monitored radio alarm systems, duress alarms. Uh, we've been performing a whole lot of staff de-escalation training uh, and putting on additional security staff, including the patrol cars that identify areas and routes of concern and then um, head out uh, to be on them. There's also the post-incident support and counselling uh, that we offer and our participation in the state government's bus driver safety forum. When the state government uh, set out on this path of uh, implementing bus driver uh, barriers, they uh, they commenced that in 2018 and they said uh, after implementation they would commence a review. So that was uh, two years ago and we're yet to hear um, what the status of that review will be. And you know, council is probably in a pretty good position to provide some practical feedback in that respect given we've had these uh, barriers in operation for some time now. But I will just say, um, in terms of the passenger experience uh, and the bus driver operator experience, you know, you, um, your mileage may vary. Some buses, uh, some bus operators don't mind uh, being uh, behind the barrier. Others uh, hate it with a passion. And, um, you know, we're not gonna be able to find a one size fits all uh, approach here. Um, 
but we are open to full encapsulation in terms of uh, the new bus build, purchasing new buses. We would be open uh, to that. Um, but it's something that um, we have to uh, really build out in the procurement process and that we have to take our drivers on uh, a journey with. We know, as Councillor Cassidy said, the Metro vehicle will be fully encapsulated because drivers will be uh, separated in a different cabin from passengers, working through how they interact with passengers in that um, separate cabin and they're still able to provide that high level of customer service and friendliness um, that our drivers are renowned for around the country is really critical. So, um, you know, we welcome any feedback that the union the union has on that. And obviously, uh, it has to work in the real world as well. Um, Councillor Sri, uh, you, you spoke about uh, free off-peak services and I suppose the potential for that to, to stimulate um, the economy. Uh, look, we, we know that seniors' uh, free off-peak travel has been a massive success, um, but I'm just aware of, I suppose, some of the perverse outcomes that could be generated by a fully, fully free uh, off-peak travel you know, in and around uh, the city. You've got to remember that this is just one council that sits at the core of a whole range of South East Queensland councils, um, the vast majority of which would absolutely be completely gleeful if Brisbane City Council announced that we would be taking all travel uh, for anyone on our buses uh, free in the off-peak because what you would see is an enormous explosion of people commuting to the city boundaries or to get onto a Brisbane City Council service uh, to be able to catch that. So I think there's people much smarter than you and I uh, that have uh, done the maths on this and they've realised that uh, to make all services off-peak would in indeed encourage some perverse outcomes. And I'm just not sure uh, the value proposition for Brisbane City Council ratepayers uh, to subsidise that much wider expansion of that service to other uh, competing councils, which is really what you're talking about. That kind of a policy uh, is certainly best uh, handled at the TransLink level, at a TransLink policy level, at a ministerial level. I'd certainly, um, certainly welcome uh, any approach uh, that you might want to make to uh, Minister Bailey on that. It's not something uh, that we've discussed because we know that whenever we've raised revenue leakage with the state government in the past, uh, they push back very strongly. They very much uh, like the revenue that they receive from buses and I think would be very reticent uh, to, to give it up. So it's not something that um, we take to them because, again, we leave. Sure. Uh, hang on. Sorry, is there a point of order? Yeah, yeah I just wondering if, wonder if Councillor Murphy would take a quick question. Councillor Murphy, would you take a question? Uh, just Captain Murphy, three chair. Do you, do you have a rough idea of estimated foregone revenue? I know that earlier figure of eighty million dollars per year would be quite out of date now. Uh, that's still the latest figure that, that I, I'm going off, Councillor Shree. Um, if there's an, if there's an, which you know, at the end of it, in, in a three billion dollar budget, it doesn't seem that much. We all, we can all accept that. Um, but the reality is that money has to come from somewhere. And what what I'm saying to you is that. What you would be proposing is that Brisbane City Council's ratepayers subsidise all the ratepayers from the surrounding councils that would then make the journey on our roads into our city to catch that public transport. And you would generate some uh, extremely perverse outcomes, I think, and uh, particularly in those fringe suburbs that surround the city. And I, I just think um, that you need to be aware of those issues. I know that. Um, you know, in your world, we can go and we can just put up a fruit tree on the side of the road and it'll grow and it'll be beautiful and people come pick fruit off it. Um, but what you don't think about is the, the fruit that then drops from that tree, the rotten fruit, the bats, all the pests and the other issues that come along with that. And I think that is really a great analogy for a lot of the policy issues that you propose in this place. They're well-meaning, but they're not well thought through. So um, with those few words, Chair, I will uh, wrap up now. I can show you a lot of great fruit trees that are really... That's commuters, the rotten fruit. That's terrible. All right. Now, uh, I will now put item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On item B, all those in favour of item B, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy. And Councillor Strunk, please ring the bells.
Yes, Councillors, all those in favour of item B, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. no. Thank you, please lower your hands. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. The Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Maddock. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before I move on to the uh, committee report, I'd just like to, uh, again, draw attention to the uh, state government's Street Smarts campaign. I mentioned this last week in the council meeting and I'm pleased to see that uh, the advertising for this has been ramping up, non-political advertising, good to see, uh, with a focus on road safety, the responsibility that we all share um, with specific messages about tailgating and uh, other dangerous behaviours uh, like not giving way and running red lights. So all the issues that we see and people ask us about that uh, by and large come down to, to driver responsibility. I think this is a, a great campaign. I support it wholeheartedly and uh, I hope it continues and I hope uh, people start to pay attention to the issues that it raises. Um, Mr Chair, last week at the Infrastructure Committee meeting, uh, we had a, a briefing about the uh, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, also known as the MUTCD. Now, this is a, uh, a fairly weighty document that comprises 15 parts and covers the rules and regulations for all aspects of road and traffic management, including speeding, parking, traffic calming, signage and signals. It does get updated um, and um, it is required to be compliant or uh, run parallel with the Osroad standards as well. So the standards that apply elsewhere outside of Queensland. So it does provide quite specific requirements that uh, our officers are obliged to adhere to and sign off on as engineers uh, with, if there are any changes. The presentation we had last week talked about um, three cohorts, if you like, or criteria that are generally known as uh, in the business as shall, should and may. Um, the shall being the things that we are obliged to do uh, and there is some opportunity for optional um, changes at the May end of the scale, but they're not too many. Most of the things that we're responsible for fall into the shall category uh, we're obliged to do. So um, out of interest, we, we talked about the number of assessments um, that come through from the Transport Planning and Operations branch with the number of requests that come from the community and from councillors, something like 12,000 in the last financial year. And most of those are obliged to be considered in the context of the MUTCD. Um, they relate to requests for stop signs, speed signs, speed limits, parking signs and yellow lines. So, um, Mr Chair, this was a, a great presentation to the rules that regulate all traffic planning across Queensland. It served uh, as a good reminder to members of the committee and uh, through the committee to the council that when, when it comes to making changes to our road network, we are obliged to follow these rules that are set by the state government through the Department of Transport and Main Roads. Um, Mr Chair, there were some petitions there as well, three petitions relating to things that uh, are considered through the context of the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, I'll leave those for any further debate and, uh, and respond accordingly if I need to. Further speakers? Yes. Councillor Cummings? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. I'd refer to items uh, B, C and D uh, from this report. They all relate to uh, parking limit, parking time limits in uh, Wynnum Central. 
they arose uh, essentially because of uh, the uh, number of fines being issued by the uh, Brisbane City Council in uh, Florence Street, Wynnum, which has got a, had a half-hour parking limit. The idea of the half-hour parking limit, which had been in place for some years, was to encourage a quick turnaround of uh, cars in that street and uh, uh, allow people to just have short short visits to uh, a particular business in the street and then uh, and then get out of there. Uh, unfortunately, when the uh, council employed their new technology, uh, the fancy looking little car and came along, the uh, number of fines started going through the roof in 19, uh, in 2017-18, it was $24,000 worth of fines. In 2018-19, it dropped to 12580 But in 2019-20, in the first half of the financial year, that's only from July 1 to December 31, uh, the number, the amount of fines went up from 50 to $54,870, which was, if it had continued for the full year, would have been an 854% increase uh, in fines in, uh, in one year. Uh, I've got to say, I, I don't have the final figures for the uh, that financial year, but uh, in January 2020, there was $10,699 worth of fines, so it looks like it was continuing. I believe it did uh, slow down during the lockdown, uh, which was uh, the least the council could do, but the, uh, the uh, car, the offending car that issues the fines has been seen around Wynnum Central a lot recently. Anyhow, uh, I did a survey of uh, businesses in uh, Florence Street and uh, a majority agreed to change it from half hour to one hourly uh, to hopefully get less people fined. Uh, the uh, Bay Terrace and Florence Street, the, the other two main uh, streets in the Wynnum Central strip shopping centre area remain predominantly two hour time limits. Uh, so people who uh, uh, need to get the, ladies who need to get their hair done can uh, hopefully get that done during that time. Uh, the uh, uh, businesses in the area have been struggling. There was a lot of vacancies before the uh, COVID hit, and uh, there's even more now. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, council not uh, be too hard line in issuing fines because of. Uh, uh, parking infringements because once people get fined a couple of times, they're not likely to come back to the area. So uh, I'll be continuing to monitor the situation and uh, these, these similar petitions to these petitions have been previously dealt with by council. Uh, at this stage, it looks like a satisfactory situation has been reached and I hope to, that it will continue in future. Thank you. Thanks. Good speaking. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. I um, uh, will speak on item uh, clause E uh, and ask that that be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. Voting. Yes, thanks. So this um, this petition uh, from local residents is calling for a variety of things, including uh, traffic lights, pedestrian crossings, or speed bumps at the intersections of Adam Street, Lofter Street, and Barclay Streets. Um, Deegan, uh, locals know that this uh, intersection is a real problem. Um, it's not your standard run-of-the-mill intersection. It uh, operates as a four-way intersection, uh, but it's actually three different roads intersecting uh, where uh, Barclay and Lofter Streets are offset from each other, but it all intersect Adam Street at the same point. So I know it's not an easy one to solve, but there has to be a better option than doing nothing. This is something that I've been um, raising with council officers each and every year through the budget process. Um, outside of budget time uh, when these issues are raised by local residents. And uh, granted, there um, have been um, paint applied to the road um, at various times over the last decade or so, um, but I think it's an intersection that needs more work than, um, than a response that says it's all too hard. It's a busy local route, five days a week. Uh, it's used by Sangate High and Sangate State School kids, and you often see them playing Frogger along this um, section of road trying to get to and from the Deegan train station or um, crossing the busy um, Adam Street getting to school. Um, uh, there are um, busy and popular shops at this intersection, uh, including Mythos Cafe and Deegan Bog Meats and a uh, mechanic uh, and a community art gallery. Outrageous um, is also at the intersection there. There are often near misses with cars and pedestrians. I have uh, witnessed these and almost been involved in them uh, myself. Um, so we need to, I think um, it's a pretty um, pretty well accepted thing uh, these days, Chair, particularly at the moment, 
the need to create more walkable and safe neighbourhoods, but uh, this response is business as usual and won't do that. Uh, so that's why we're not going to be supporting um, this petition response today. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Council on the block room. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, look, uh, thank you for those those comments in relation to the petitions, in relation to the parking sign changes. Of course, uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Cumming, um, he was having a, a go there at the fines imposed. Uh, not my portfolio responsibility, as he, I'm sure, well knows. Um, but uh, the request was made for changed changes to the signs, which was implemented. I, I make the point that so concerned was. Councillor Cumming, through through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Cumming, about these issues that the petition that was raised in February and was acted on almost immediately, uh, Councillor Cumming didn't respond to the petitions to the request to the request to respond to the petitions until the end of June. So a long time sitting on your desk there, Councillor Cumming, before we finally got a response that allowed from you that allowed us to process these petitions, uh, and that's why it did take some time to come through. To to the committee for a uh, response to the petitions. If uh, you'd been a little faster, we would have had the responses faster as well, but indeed the, the work was already undertaken by then to make changes to those signs. Uh, to, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Cassidy, look, uh, safety is always our first and highest priority for making any changes to the road network. Uh, but as all councillors know, um, these changes, the changes to the network are based on priorities, based on need. I, I understand that intersection I, and I do understand that it is a little complicated. Traffic lights uh, would be uh, an improvement there. I, I suggest you continue to talk to your local transport planning and operations officers about that priority and uh, it will be put on the priority list. But at the moment, across the city, there are other locations that have a higher priority. So hence the reason for the response to this petition at this time. Councillors, I'll now put to, I'll now put items A through D. A through D. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Thank you. The ayes have it. On item E, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And please lower them. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. Thank you. The ayes have it. The ayes have it on A through D and on E. And there's a division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths, I think. Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths, please ring the bells. Councillors on item E, uh, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. Those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Clark, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. The ayes have it on all items. Councillors, uh, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Davis, the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Cunningham? 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Our presentation last week was on recent park upgrades throughout the city. And I think that we can all agree the team has done a great job in delivering unique parks that service the community need right across the city. The presentation looked at Ascot Park, West End Riverlands Park, Milton Urban Common, Davies Park, Whitten Barracks Playground, Foreshore Lighting at Wynnum and Sandgate, the City Botanic Gardens, Ray Lynch Park, Wishart Park, Burndall Wetland Centre, Cadogan Street Park, Disc Golf Course, Bradbury Park, River Terrace Kangaroo Point, and the Wakeley District and Bill Brown Sports Parks. All the parks were funded through LGIP or budget line items. In committee last week, we also had two petitions and a park naming. A petition from residents requesting that council remove 11 bush turkeys from Rockingham Street at Mount Cravat due to the damage caused to residents' gardens. I understand that Councillor Adams is working with the residents, neighbouring school and the local parish to address environmental modifications in the area as a first step to deter the bush turkeys. The second petition was a petition requesting council provide a segregated small dog area in the dog off leash area in Mulm Beam Park at Boondal. Councillor Cassidy and I work to find an outcome that I hope will be suitable for the local community there. And finally, the park naming submission was for Hannah's Place. So I was pleased to be able to bring forward this park naming request, which will formally name a section of Bill Hewitt Reserve Camp Hill to Hannah's Place in memory of Hannah Clark and her children, Aaliyah, Liana and Trey. The section of park on the corner of Samuel and Jade Street will now forever be a place of remembrance and reflection. So Hannah attended Whites Hill State College and has family connections to the area. And it's a special place, um, I think, for to recognise her. It's also the site of where the community vigil was held earlier this year. I've worked closely with the Clark family on this and we hope to um, really continue to build awareness of domestic violence issues in our community. And I'll leave comments to the Chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I'm just going to speak on um, the committee presentation completed. Um, park projects, um, we support um, park upgrades, uh, of course, um, and have often called for more because the suburbs of Brisbane are in desperate need um, of a revamp. We are, however, concerned about um, uh, often where parts um, used for these upgrades are made from and sourced from. And we saw this um, earlier this year. The Lord Mayor and the LNP team here in Council um, often talk a big game about buying local uh, and using local manufacturers, but we do know that that is not always the case. Uh, in the Council's quarterly financial report for March, which um, came to this place last session, uh, that stated a number of works and parks were delayed due to supply chain issues relating to the delivery of play equipment from Europe. Uh, and that um, really only came to light because of COVID-19 and the supply chain issues um, that meant those uh, parts uh, were not readily available to be um, shipped to Australia. Uh, and, um, you know, often these companies may be, have, have an office here in Brisbane, uh, but um, um, these parts are not manufactured here in Brisbane. These are not Brisbane-based companies. So there might be a, an office with a couple of staff here that are then ordering um, click and collect from um, overseas locations. So um, that really isn't by local and shouldn't be treated um, as by local. It's not adding to the manufacturing base we have here in Brisbane and jobs that we will need uh, in the um, short and medium term. Uh, so uh, you can't um, say stick a buy local um, motto on a lot of these park upgrades when we know that they aren't being sourced from genuine local manufacturers. Uh, we have hundreds of parks across Brisbane that are... Um, needing upgrades and sourcing equipment from local manufacturers uh, would boost the local economy at a time when that kind of support is crucial from every level of government. So uh, we would certainly hope that um, an economic stimulus plan as we come out of COVID here in Brisbane would include a genuine buy-local approach and not a buy-local uh, approach that is essentially click and collect. So what we need to do is see genuine uh, buy-local, keeping ratepayer funds circulating in the Brisbane economy and not uh, sending that um, profit overseas. Uh, we should be seeing much greater urgency in rolling out new park projects this financial year, um, which um, will help Brisbane's economic recovery. Uh, projects like in my neck of the woods, the upgrade of the Brighton Foreshore, they are ready to go and ready to create local jobs and deliver real benefits to residents right across uh, Brisbane, not just uh, in my local community. It's a project that has languished under this administration and is well and truly time 
uh, to kick this off and um, get this job creating project going. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I just rise to speak briefly on item C, the petition, as Councillor Cunningham mentioned, uh, around the uh, brush turkeys that we have in the Mount Cravat area, a very residential area in Mount Cravat, but obviously also very close to Mount Cravat Mountain and the Chewy Forest as well. And there is an issue with quite a few uh, different um, concerns we have with uh, brush turkeys in the area. And uh, I've been working with the local residents as it was mentioned there. It's very hard to get rid of brush turkeys. They love setting up and not leaving when they get established. Uh, but there is a lot of leaf litter that's been left by the parish and a bit by council as well that we're working through to make sure it's a least attractive area for the brush turkeys and working with the residents on some strategies they can as well. Um, and uh, I thank the officers for the work they do there. I should have said I would also like to speak briefly on item um, uh, D as well and say, obviously, there is uh, a lot of issues around this. Uh, the local buy and COVID have mean circumstances have actually created a lot of differences around uh, the opportunities and, and held up things that we have to do in our parks. But the reality is that this is an administration that takes their delivery of parks very seriously. We make sure we have the best equipment sourced um, from the best places and if we can do it locally obviously our procurement um, uh, policy right now is let's do it local but these things were ordered well before um, the COVID and the con contracts were signed and we need to stick with the contracts that we have signed and uh, just like everybody right across the world there are hold-ups that have been unforeseen. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Cunningham. That's fine. Thanks Mr Chair. I'll now, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. You and those against, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councillor Marks. Sorry, took a minute to find the button. Um, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee held, meeting held on Tuesday the 4th of August 2020 be adopted. It's been moved by Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Toomey, the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 4th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Marks? Uh, we can't hear you, Chair. I, I've, invited you to, I've invited you to speak. Councillor Marks, please speak to the report. Still can't hear you. Let's just talk. You talk. You talk. Please, please. Chris, okay. Is there any debate? Marks, Marks? You've been invited to talk. Councillor Marks, can you hear me? The chair has asked you to speak. Okay, I've got, a te I've got a text message saying that I need to just continue talking, so that's what I'm going to do, apparently. <laughs> okay, so, um, look, just briefly before I get to my committee report, can I just mention something that Councillor Cumming was talking about in the Infrastructure Committee about these um, parking um, time limits and stuff and increases and decreases in various areas without his um, ward of Wynnum. Um, I don't know the full story behind all of this, but reading some of the petitions that would suggested that there was an initial request to put some um, parking limit signs in, which then officers obviously went and did as requested. Um, people potentially were not paying attention to the parking limited signs, and then there was a request made for cars officers to do enforcement, which they obviously did, um, and, um, and now they're sort of being um, told that they shouldn't be um, working not to go too hard line with issuing fines and now you want the signs moved back again. I just want to say on behalf of cars officers, you know, it's really, it's a bit tough on them when, you know, they're asked to do a job, they're given very specific guidelines of what that job would mean um, and they're not given fancy little cars. They're quite, they're little wee cars that are, don't cost a lot of money and they're just blue and yellow so everybody knows 
actually there and they're, they're widely seen by anyone in the public and their job is to drive along and do exactly what councillors are asking them to do, which is enforce um, situations where um, parking has been abused. So I would suggest if you um, don't want the officers to come out and um, find the residents doing the wrong thing in these parking spaces, make sure you get your signs that you actually want in place in the first place and then we don't have this, this issue of council officers being blamed for something that they've been asked to do. To go on to the committee presentation, there was um, a presentation on the Mudcat, which is a new piece of machinery that was purchased um, and I understand Councillor Maddock is going to talk on the um, Chambers about that given that the work was undertaken in his ward and there was um, four petitions which I'm happy to leave to the Chamber for debate. Further speakers? Councillor Maddock. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to speak to item A, uh, which is the presentation on the Mudcat. Uh, and um, I'd really like to acknowledge the tremendous uh, work that the officers have done to get this project up and running and now functioning. Um, I recall it being a Better Brisbane proposal uh, which was a, a proposal put in place by the administration to provide flexibility for, for unique opportunities for Brisbane Council to engage with the market on uh, technology and other upgrades. And this MarkCat is a perfect example of that. The Castle Main uh, drain uh, that in which it uh, undertook its work is actually a fundamental piece of infrastructure for the local area, but importantly also provides the catchment um, opportunities for Red Hill in order to get that water away. And so you can see the intensive use of the existing infrastructure from, from Red Hill down through there and ultimately out to the river. The challenge that the officers have always faced is silt from the river, building its way up through the drain and then blocking any of the water coming down. Um, and it has always been a physical challenge for officers to have to go in there and uh, carry out extensive work manually or through different types of equipment as far as they could reach to try and get a good outcome. Um, the proposal of the Mudcat was uh, seen as a, a really effective and cost, uh, time effective, but also cost effective way of being able to deal with that. And the presentation before us clearly shows that it has worked uh, tremendously well from, from when the project was undertaken through March, uh, from March through to July. Um, there's an extraordinary amount of silt that it removed over 1,200 cubic metres uh, being undertaken in an effective and importantly also safe way clearing out that drain and letting the officers get their work done. So I really want to uh, say that this is a great initiative by Brisbane City Council in partnership with the operators of, the, of this Mudcat to be able to make uh, these effective outcomes possible, not only in my ward, but importantly also as they roll this Mudcat out, uh, it will uh, cause great benefit to our local community. And again, this is core business that Brisbane City Council is undertaking an effective and efficient way to deliver great outcomes in our local communities. Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair. I can hear you now. I think I must have pushed a button wrong. <laughs> My apologies. Um, no, look, that's fine. If no one's got any other comments on the petitions or anything, I'm happy to leave the report at that. I'll now put the report, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. You please lower your hands and those against, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the meeting of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee held on the 9th of June 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers with the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Uh, thank you, Chair. We had a presentation from the Manager of Community Facilities and Venues on City Aquatics. And uh, last financial year, a new pool was opened at Runghorn and refurbishments were undertaken at four sites across the city, including the Sandgate Aquatic Centre, Langlands Park Memorial Pool, Balbarry Pool and Musgrave Park Swimming Pool. So whilst it was unfortunate that all of our 22 pools were forced to close on the 23rd of March due to the state government restrictions, the silver lining was that maintenance works were able to be fast-tracked during the closures 
including repainting of several pools, including Dunlop Park and Hibiscus Sports Complex pools. Uh, new synthetic, synthetic turf was installed at Langlands Park Memorial Pool. Uh, terrace sandstone seating was installed at Parkinson Aquatic Centre um, and the wading pool was repainted at Balbowrie Pool. We also received an update on Council's major project to redevelop Musgrave Park Pool, which includes a disability access bathroom and accessibility ramp to the program pool. And we are looking forward to opening the pool to residents in September, just in time to kick off our summer swim season. This year, Council will undertake planning works for the renovation of the pool basin at Newmarket Pool. And we are also rolling out smart water meters to help reduce water usage. Uh, Chair, there were also four petitions considered by the committee last week as outlined in the committee report, and I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll be speaking on items B, C, D and E. I ask that item D be taken seriatim for voting only. D, seriatim for voting. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, these items have a history in this place. Back in February this year, immediately following the publication of two of these petitions online, I moved an urgency motion in the council chamber that read as follows. The Brisbane City Council immediately removed the petitions titled Ban LGBTIQ Plus Programs from Brisbane City Council Libraries with the principal petitioner, Peter Hayden of Runcorn, that closes on 13 June 2020 and titled Adult Entertainment is Not Suitable for Children, with the principal petitioner Wendy Francis of Mitchelton that closed on 31 January 2020 from the council petition process. The urgency motion also said that the Lord Mayor personally issue a public apology to the LGBTIQ plus community on behalf of the Brisbane City Council for any offence and hurt caused by the publication of these petitions via the Brisbane City Council website. Mr Chair, this motion was voted down by the LNP as a block. Not one LNP councillor in this place, nor the Lord Mayor, thought that these petitions should be removed from the council website. And not one of them thought that the Lord Mayor should issue a public apology to the LGBTIQ plus community on behalf of Brisbane City Council for the publication of these petitions on the council website. Mr Chair, here we are six months later and as a result of these petitions not being removed by the Lord Mayor at that time, we are here again to debate them. What has happened with two of these petitions is shameful. The fact that they were allowed to be published on the council website in the first place is shameful. And the hurt and distress they have caused to the LGBTIQ plus community is unacceptable. The fact that residents of this city felt that they had to launch counter petitions to these offensive petitions is a sad indictment on the way this council handles matters that they classify as potentially offensive. Let's be very clear, the petitions were offensive and the Lord Mayor and Council's response to date is offensive. These petitions made inaccurate and offensive statements about the LGBTIQ plus community. One of the petitions claimed drag is highly offensive to females. Another petition links the Safe Schools program to pedophilia. Among other claims and demands an apology from the Council for allowing drag queens to read books to children. The Lord Mayor of this city, Adrian Schrinner, when asked why Council was allowing petitions that included offensive language against his own guidelines, said, and I quote, this is obviously a subjective matter. This was never a subjective matter. The Council guidelines state that petitions must be respectful, decorous and temperate and not contain any language which is offensive or likely to be offensive to any member of the public. This council failed the LGBTIQ plus community when it came to these petitions and failed to protect one of the most vulnerable groups of people in this city. I've stated these facts before and I'm gonna state them again. Research tells us that members of the LGBTIQ plus community are twice as likely to experience anxiety disorders, three times as likely to experience affective disorders such as depression and social phobias five times more likely to experience major depressive episodes 
and up to 14 times more likely to attempt suicide. Mr Chair, these health outcomes are directly related to experiences of stigma, prejudice, discrimination and abuse on the basis of being LGBTIQ+. I also want to quote again in this place the words of two drag queens who hosted Rainbow Storytime. And I quote, to see such contempt and hatred directed at our community is shocking. Knowing that the platform generating such hate has been organised and promoted by our elected leaders creates fear and mistrust in our community. We want to work together towards a city that is free and equal in opportunity and where rights and well-being of LGBTI people are valued. Accordingly, we ask that you recognise these petitions, breach BCC guidelines and the law. Mr Chair, Labor believes in free speech, not hate speech and vilification. These petitions cross the line and the LGBTIQ plus community deserves better and Brisbane deserves better from this council. Arising from these petitions, Mr Chair, was also a referral to the Human Rights Commission and a joint public statement on the petition titled Ban LGBTIQ plus programs from Brisbane City Council Libraries has been released. It reads as follows. A petition was lodged with the Brisbane City Council in January 2020 concerning LGBTI events and rainbow story time. A vilification complaint concerning the content of this petition was lodged by drag performers and accepted by the Queensland Human Rights Commission. The person who wrote the petition and the drag performers had a meaningful discussion facilitated by a trained conciliator at Queensland Human Rights Commission. During this discussion, we came to understand each other's personal history and perspectives. We found a way to connect through our differences. After this process, all parties came to realise the importance of having these laws that protect them against harm caused by vilification and stated the need for greater awareness of these laws. The petitioner requests the harm that was caused by his petition and apologised to the performers and to the LGBTI community. More broadly, he now realises that offence was caused and that was not his intent. He said he became initially worried about whether an LGBTI program could be safe after reading online material about safe schools. The apology of the petitioner was accepted by the drag performer. It continues, the statement continues, and again I'm going to quote, this harm would never have happened if the Brisbane City Council had provided the petitioner with better feedback about the petition when he lodged it, including letting him know that it potentially breached the law and their guidelines and suggesting he talk to a lawyer. More accountability and better transparency should be expected from our elected representatives to aid democracy. Keeping government accountable is in everyone's best interest. If the petitioner had known the petition was potentially breaching the law and causing harm, he would never have sent it. Both the petitioner and the drag performers call for better communication and more responsibility for compliance with existing vilification and human rights laws to be exercised by the Brisbane City Council at the time of lodging petitions. Could not have said it better myself. Which brings me to the outcome that we are voting on today, Mr Chair. The response ultimately from Council is that Drag Queen Storytime will continue in our city libraries. Labor fully supports this position and it appears the LNP now do as well, despite not making that known for over six months when first given the opportunity. Instead, they chose to let this play out through the media, the Human Rights Commission, in the community and online causing unnecessary distress, hurt and offence. However, when it comes to the question of if the Lord Mayor should apologise or not, and if there should be the establishment of further policies to stop this from ever happening again, the LNP says no. No, the Lord Mayor should not apologise. And no, we will not take any further steps to stop this from happening again. No further policies or procedures will be enacted. No accountability. And once again, complete disregard for the thousands of residents who have stated their support for the LGBTIQ plus community via Council's own petition process. 
Well, Mr Chair, Labor says this is not good enough. And on behalf of my Labor colleagues in council, I apologise unreservedly for the hurt and offence caused by the publication of these petitions on the council website. This should never have happened and it should never happen again. I also offer my support to those affected by the Drag Queen Storytime protest at the Brisbane City Council Library on the 12th of January this year, some of whom are still suffering from that experience today. I am sorry. Please know that we stand with you, we support you, we respect you, we value you, and we always will. Thank you, Mr Chair. Here, here. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd just like to rise very briefly to speak on these uh, three petitions um, regarding uh, drag story time. Um, I just want to thank, uh, through you, Mr Chairman, thank Councillor Cook for putting all that on the record. That was extremely um, well said. Um, and I support every single thing that um, she said. Um, this was a very um, dark moment in Council's time. Um, the um, Rainbow's Family Queensland um, are a wonderful organisation. I have an active member of that organisation in, in my community and I've been pleased to support them um, when they've done local events here. Um, I particularly was impressed with the um, young person who was uh, doing drag story time um, at the time. He wrote to all of us councillors and I did reply uh, to him uh, regarding um, what had happened. I, I felt that at the time... Um, he handled the matter with extraordinary grace under terrible pressure and it must have been a really awful incident for the families that were there for story time for the council staff and for the performers themselves um, obviously this has been complicated by other factors that have occurred um, but the lord mayor's failure to call out this behavior at the time um, was a significant uh, demonstrates a significant lack of leadership on on his part um, the fact that he allowed these petitions to continue online with really offensive, incorrect information in them um, is a black mark on this Lord Mayor. I know that Councillor Cook and the Labor councillors asked at the time for these petitions to be removed and urgency motions were also moved for them to, um, to be removed from the council website. Um, uh, that it wasn't done at that point, I think, reflects um, a very serious lack of leadership by the Lord Mayor. So for all of the hurt um, that has been experienced, I would also like to offer my apologies. Um, our libraries are wonderful, inclusive places, and we want people from all walks of life, from all genders, um, to feel that libraries are safe places where they can come. Uh, we want to see um, wonderful, creative story times, and we want to see bigotry in all its forms um, not present in Brisbane City Council. Um, so I just say, Lord Mayor, take this opportunity to just apologise now. Um, the response to that petition, um, 193 people called on the Lord Mayor, uh, you know, to apologise. Um, I mean, it's the most <laughs> bland, um, sterile and appalling response to a petition. Um, when all the Lord Mayor had to do here was say, I'm sorry, you are welcome in our libraries, um, and he just did not do that. It was a really simple thing to do, and I'm very disappointed that the Lord Mayor's not done so. Um, and again, I just say um, to Johnny and all of the other performers out there uh, who may continue to do story time, drag story time in our libraries, um, there are lots of young people in the world who want role models from different um, walks of life, and I encourage you to keep giving it your best. You'll always be welcome um, in our libraries. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I might just speak really briefly to reinforce what Councillor Cook and Councillor Johnston have said. I do think these petitions and this entire saga reveals a weakness and gap in the way Council handles such issues and, and manages these petitions. And I think uh, the petition that's come before the Finance and Administration Committee also speaks to that same challenge. So um, 
I know some people will be tempted to say, oh, but this is complex and how do you weigh it up? At the end of the day, hate speech is hate speech and we should be able to identify it clearly as such. And mm -hmm. when vulnerable members of the community identify it, that stuff, I, I don't think it's satisfactory for the administration to just turn a blind eye and say, oh, free speech, people can say whatever they want and dismiss um, any concerns. So perhaps this is a lesson for all the administration councillors to think a little bit more deeply about the message it sends when something is hosted on the council website. This isn't a question of just allowing people to say or do whatever they want out there in the world. This is actually on a government website. And regardless of how it gets onto that government website, regardless of whether it's um, put up by a resident or carefully vetted, the point is it's there on a platform that has some level of social legitimacy, for want of a better term, and that people look to this website as, as being an expression of the um, general standards and norms of society. And so when you've got content up there, which is quite vile and offensive and hurtful, uh, it's inevitably going to see, be seen to reflect on the council administration, even where you put up a disclaimer saying these are public petitions, we don't control the content. So I think Councillor Howard is probably well aware of the hurt and anguish this caused, but I hope the council administration as a whole is cognizant of it and will learn from it going forward because it it really was a, yeah, a rough time for a lot of people involved. And I think the administration didn't handle it particularly well, unfortunately. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Murphy? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I wasn't going to speak on this, but I feel um, compelled to say something. Um, I want to say that uh, this is a very deeply diverse city. And when I say diverse, um, I don't just mean that we've got a lot of cultures or ethnicities or religions or a lot of different cuisines to dine on though those things are very important. And we have a massive diversity of opinion in this city, far more so than there is in this chamber. Diverse in that some members of our community think some pretty unsavoury thoughts and some do some pretty unsavoury things. But that doesn't mean that we still don't represent them. And it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to allow them to petition this place. And yes, that sometimes means that they will say things that make us deeply uncomfortable and that they will submit petitions that we won't agree with. And it's our duty as councillors. Just stop now. To accept them. Just stop now. To debate them. Objections, please. And to decide what we want to do with them. The worst possible outcome for our city, for democracy, would be for us to accept or reject petitions on the basis of forced speech. It's the law. It's the Human I'll Rights let, Act. I'll let you finish. You can let me finish. Oh. So you can see here we received one petition with 8,000 signatures uh, in favour of Drag Queen Storytime and then another petition 7,000 signatures uh, against it. And that this issue uh, does divide some people in our community. Now, thankfully, it doesn't divide anyone here in this chamber tonight. We all support Drag Queen Storytime continuing. But do you know, Councillor Cook, a person who was hurt by hate speech from those who were howling him down? It was Wilson Gavin who hurled himself in front of a train as a result of the hate speech that he received for having a deeply unpopular opinion on this very issue. So I just want to acknowledge that um, hate speech is not... That was uh, more than an opinion. No, no, no. No, no objections, please. Councillor Murphy. Hate speech can be a two-way street. Now, I don't agree with him on this issue, nor any other. But I think it's important that we keep things in perspective here. And that he and anyone else with an unpopular opinion deserves the opportunity to, pet to petition their representatives on it. And we can debate that on its merits. That would have been enough then. And it should have been enough now. 
Thank you. Further speakers? Uh, I don't see any hands. Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Chair, and um, I do thank those that participated in the debate. I know that this is a very, very emotive um, issue, but I would like to say this. Council takes its duty to promote an inclusive city seriously, and we will continue to deliver inclusive programs and activities for everyone across Brisbane. Our independent council officers assess all e-petitions prior to them being published on the council's e-petition website to ensure that they comply with legal requirements and the guidelines for submitting an e-petition. I just want to make that very, very clear. Council does support the values of inclusion, tolerance, diversity and celebration of all members of our Brisbane community now, some topics raised in petitions could potentially offend some people. However, this is not always a basis for council to reject the submission of a petition. Petitions by their very nature are a mechanism for the public to express a view about a matter affecting them and or their community. We unapologetically support our diverse Brisbane communities because we believe in the universal inclusion of all residents and visitors, including our LGBTIQ plus communities. Because Brisbane is a city for everyone and everyone deserves to feel included and feel that they belong in this beautiful city that we are fortunate to call home. And that is the core of everything we do here at Council. And that's why we will continue to support programs like Drag Queen and Rainbow Family Story Times that are part of hundreds of different events held in council libraries each year that foster a diverse and inclusive city. And Chair, through you, I would just like to finish by sending a huge, huge thank you to our council staff, many of whom who were severely impacted by this whole situation. And can I say they are the most fabulous team. They've constantly, constantly um, ensured that everybody was safe in, in our libraries. And I do want to just acknowledge the work that our council library teams do each and every day. And um, on that note, I commend it to the chamber. I'll now put items A, B, C, and E. All those in favour of items A, B, C, and E, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On item D, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you, and those against item D, please say no and raise your hand. No. Um, the ayes have it. Division. 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 Councillor Cassidy, please ring the bells. <laughs> Councillors, on item D, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hands. Those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. 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 Thank you, please lower your hands. Clarks, please read the, excuse me, Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 10, uh, sorry, 18 in favour and seven against. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance Administration Small Business Committee, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that the report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. You can move by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we uh, had a presentation at uh, the last committee meeting. It's a, uh, a regular economic 
Outlook presentation that uh, is entitled Net Borrowings Investment Funding, and it was for the June quarter. And I think it's worth noting that the June quarter in particular reflected effectively the, the onset months of um, COVID during April, May, and June. And the presentation covered the global domestic and, and Queensland outlook. And not surprisingly, it was um, COVID heavy, the, the, the impact that COVID's had on, uh, on all economies. And I guess the, uh, the message in that particular report is that the outlook for growth was extremely low for the remainder of 2020, and that that was likely to continue into 2021. And it's clear um, that the outlook is still quite patchy, even domestically in Australia, we're seeing uh, very different circumstances. We're in Queensland here, we have uh, very little or no community transmission, and yet in Victoria, they're, they're facing quite a challenge down there. So um, the outlook is very uncertain. Um, unemployment, uh, the outlook is um, also very, uh, very subdued. We're looking at unemployment probably in the vicinity of 5 to 8%, but quite possibly as high as 10%. Once again, we're very much uh, at the mercy of um, COVID and how that continues to impact the economy. Uh, and also uh, in, the, in the context of um, sort of other financial levers, interest rates are likely to remain very low for the foreseeable future. Now that's great, I guess, if you're a borrower and you've got an income, but it's uh, pretty grim if you're a retiree and relying on an income stream from deposits and the like. So uh, certainly there's pressure out there. The uh, Queensland economy is suffering in terms of reduced uh, agricultural exports and that's flowing through to, to the wider economy as well. So uh, that presentation was sobering, but nonetheless, it's uh, good to have a view of um, where we might be heading. Um, we also had a committee report, the Net Borrowings, Cash Investments and Funding for June 2020, and that's uh, there available in the papers. We had three petitions come to the committee as well, and I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the um, three petitions that came before the committee last week. Um, I just have a really quick question for Councillor Cara Cook for with petition C, which may, she may, might speak to you briefly, which was just, uh, aren't you, uh, are you worried at all that um, relinquishing this land for the use of the school might foreclose or make more difficult future upgrades to the library? I'd just be genuinely interested in, in your thoughts on that and whether I know there was talk of expanding the library and getting um, additional... Sure. Uh, Councillor Shree, that's, it's fine to raise the question, but can I just ask you to, um, once again, direct comments through the chair and refer to people by their full titles? Sure Thank enough. you. Yeah, at, anyway, that's all. Um, I'll be interested in Councillor Cook's response on that. Um, the petition B, I thought, was a, a timely one because there's obviously some pretty significant uh, concerns around... The, the way these petitions are coming up on online and the fact that uh, it seems at the moment that council doesn't employ any kind of strong filter um, or any filter at all whatsoever. So uh, any petition about any topic and containing any material could potentially end up on the council website, which certainly invites a lot of mischief, if nothing else. But I think also raises those same questions I referred to in the previous debate, which is that um, there's a there's a chance of causing real harm here. This isn't just about some abstract theoretical marketplace of ideas where people um, are free to say whatever the hell they want and um, regardless of the impacts on others. The, the way people talk about issues does impact each other. Um, and I think that, that there's a reason that anti-discrimination legislation and human rights legislation draws distinctions uh, between or defines these ideas of hate speech. And I think it's really important that we recognize why that exists and maybe pay attention to that, those concerns. Um, I, I was a little dif disappointed in the chair's response to the questions and, and it was a shame we didn't get much time to debate that um, in the committee itself, but there, there's clearly a range of mechanisms that a website moderator or an administration can use to ensure that people still have a chance to have their voices heard um, 
while guarding against really damaging hate speech. Um, anything from there's a whole spectrum of responses from flagging potential controversial content and having it re reviewed to um, allowing stuff to be published, but publishing it with a disclaimer or some kind of content warning or um, referring con potentially um, hurtful stuff to a third party for review before it goes up. The point is we need some processes in place because at the moment it, there's a bit of a decision making or there's a bit of a process vacuum where Councillor Allen, the chair, appeared to acknowledge that there might be some petitions the, whose content is so hateful and offensive that we wouldn't want them published. And, and it seems probably that all councillors, maybe um, maybe I shouldn't say all councillors, but it seems like the majority of councillors would agree that surely some content might not be appropriate to be published on, on the website through the petition page. So presumably every councillor would draw the line somewhere. The point is we don't have particularly clear policies or guidelines about where those lines should be drawn. And in the absence of clear policies and guidelines, that creates a situation where unelected public servants are using their own discretion about how offensive something has to be before it's pulled down. Um, it's not clear to me whether, um, yeah, how, how closely those guidelines are enforced. And I think there's a real gap there. And I made a few such suggestions to... Councillor Allen, which he said he'd look into and, and, and explore further. And I think that's a positive step. But I guess my, my point really is just that I don't think it is good enough to say, oh, we'll just allow any petition up there at, with any content without vetting, because I know this council administration would vet um, some petitions that the administration feels are particularly offensive and particularly horrific in terms of content. So. We know that some vetting does go on and probably would go on. And it's a question of what policies and guidelines do we have in place to ensure that that vetting is um, carried out in a way that, that isn't party political or doesn't um, result in a concentration of, of unaccountable power. Um, just turning to the other petition that came before the committee petition D requesting that all elected officials from including councillors and the Lord Mayor take a 30% pay cut. Um, I agree with that. I'm quite happy to support that. I think it's perfectly reasonable for councillors to make do with a little bit less, particularly at a time when so many people have lost income, when politicians are paid so much more than the average wage in society, there's a real risk that people will lose touch with the lived realities of what it's like to get by on a very low income. And we can talk about, yes, there are other ways to stay in touch with the electorate. And yes, um, People have imaginative power and can empathise, even if you're not going through something yourself. But I think it's it's pretty clear that um, we're paid quite a lot of money, and as a result, the our, our material experiences of life in the city are going to be different from those at the bottom end of the economic pyramid, and that that does shape our thinking. Um, more to the point, though, that, that there's a concern that those big salaries are going to attract people to the job who aren't necessarily there for the right reasons. They're doing it for the money. They're not doing it for um, the, that broader goal of public service and representation. And I think that is something kind of concerning to me. I worry that some people might be tempted to run for office and might win, not because they actually want to serve the people, but because they want a big fat paycheck. Um, and I think given the circumstances we're in at the moment, when so many programs and services are getting funding cuts, when people are losing jobs when council is saying that it doesn't have the money to undertake essential public infrastructure work. Uh, it would seem fair and reasonable for us to, as councillors to consider taking a pay cut. And frankly, I don't think 30%, uh, I, I would argue that we could even go further than that and take a larger pay cut than that. Um, I acknowledge that I don't have any dependent children that I have to care for, but um, if there are plenty of people on very low incomes in, in this city who, who raise children and, and care for dependents um, without the, the um, privileges that we all enjoy. And I think it's grounding to think about that and, and acknowledge um, that this, these high salaries do change the way we experience the city and experience life in, in this place. And maybe there's, there's a, there's, there's a need to reflect on that more deeply and understand that um, 
we can never step step out wholly outside our own subjective experiences and we can never fully empathize with the struggles that other people are going through if we haven't lived those struggles ourselves um and it, it always blows my mind talking to certain politicians to to see just how out of touch they are with the needs of the very very poor in this city um and i think they're out of touch partly because they've never experienced not just poverty but they've never even experienced having to ex exercise some level of um financial restraint um and I, I think that does shape their thinking and i think that's problematic and needs to be addressed but anyway i'm probably the only person who's going to support that petition or and, and object to that response but i'll be interested to see if any other councillors have thoughts on it further speakers councillor strong uh thanks mr uh, thanks chair i'm entering the debate on clause b the uh, petition calling on brisbane city council to include a new prerequisite uh, rule uh, for creating petitions to coincide with the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1991. And Chair, could I ask uh, that this clause be taken seriatim for voting purposes? Item B will be taken seriatim for voting. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, petitions are a fundamental tool of our democracy and we should encourage our citizens to use petitions as a means of bringing about change. It is incumbent uh, on council that we treat each petition against a set of guidelines that council officers can use to determine if it is compliant with the current Anti-Discrimination Act and also the Queensland Human Rights Act. Mr. Chair, we believe that the guidelines that council officers are currently using are limiting and should be reviewed so that uh, petitioners can have a clear understanding of what is accepted and what is not. We need a set of guidelines that analyzes, reviews, and filters petitions, making sure that the language used then doesn't breach the Discrimination and Human Rights Acts. Mr. Chair, petitions are about highlighting and solving community issues not creating them by using discriminatory language to harass, vilify, and bully certain groups of people in Brisbane. We believe that the current process is flawed and it is in need of a complete review. In committee this morning, in committee, Councillor Sri raised this issue and to the credit of Councillor Allen, he was open to receiving written suggestions on how to improve the current process. Mr. Chair, what is really needed is not is a root and branch review, consulting widely so that we can find a set of clearer and more comprehensive guidelines that will give residents confidence in the transparency of the process we believe is sadly in need of work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, to items B and D. Um, just briefly, I would be happy to support um, such changes to Council's petition uh, processes. It's, it's clear uh, to me, both in the Lord Mayor's original comments when this matter was um, debated, um, uh, when the incident happened um, earlier in the year, and Councillor Murphy's comments um, just a few minutes ago that they really fail to understand, um, they fail to understand what hate speech is, for want of a better word, and what our obligations as civic leaders are to ensure that it's not happening in um, their council that we are representatives for. Um, you know, the petition claims in some of these petitions were just extraordinary. Um, they were inappropriate for us to publish. Um, by publishing them, um, we went... Um, too far in allowing that and it's not a matter of censorship no one wants censorship um, but when people make unfounded claims like uh, drags offensive to women or females medical experts warn about confusing children about gender I mean the, these are these are not appropriate things to be saying in a in a public um, 
space and in an organisation um, that espouses uh, tolerance and inclusivity. Um, to me, this council is saying one thing and then doing something else. Um, you've got to actually walk the talk and that's where this council falls down over and over again. So I'm happy to vote for uh, rules to ensure that our petitions um, uh, reflective of the standards under the Anti-Discrimination Act, and I think that's a, a good safeguard. Um, you know, we don't necessarily want a politician making a decision on that, um, uh, even though the Lord Mayor was specifically asked to deal with these matters. Um, but I do think making sure we meet our obligations under the Anti-Discrimination Act would be a good thing. Um, with respect to item D, I take a slightly different view to uh, Councillor Shree, um, but I don't support the petition response in its uh, current form. Um, I mean, Councillor, Councillor Shree might choose, his lifestyle is to choose to live on a houseboat and, um, you know, do all of these things. That's great. Um, for the first, I don't know, eight years of my life, the toilet was outside. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, it, you know, we all come from different walks of life and, um, you know, the level of remuneration that is offered here is very good without question. Um, and certainly it is something that we always have to work to justify in the community. Um, where this petition goes wrong, in my view, um, there are two things. Um, firstly, I absolutely and fundamentally agree with the petitioners um, when they say there should be accountability in the allowance expenditure of the chairpersons of council. Um, this is something that I've moved motions on last year to ensure that there is accountability um, in the expenditure of allowances, and that was voted down by the LNP. Um, in my view, the petition response is actually factually incorrect. Um, it states uh, that the council has no power uh, to, it's not within the purview of the Lord Mayor and councillors to amend their remuneration packages. Yes, it is. And we demonstrated that last year when we did take a pay cut. So, for example, um, a response to this petition could have been that we will refer the matter back to the remuneration tribunal to assess um, whether or not um, the uh, level of remuneration is appropriate in the current circumstances. That's not a response to this petition. So council is actually telling the public and this petitioner something that is absolutely factually incorrect. We have the power to brief the remuner remuneration tribunal just as the Lord Mayor chose to do last year um, with respect to um, superannuation. And the fact that he's not putting that answer forward here um, is this is why people think politicians are tricky. It doesn't matter what level of government you're at. Um, when you're not up front with people about why you're doing something, that's why they lose confidence in um, politicians. And, you know, to my mind, we could have been much clearer with people about this. Either we say as a councillor we think that this is a reasonable level of, remedi uh, of remuneration, um, we should be publicly accounting for every single cent um, in allowances. Instead, this administration just takes it all as cash in the back pocket, spends it however they like with no accountability whatsoever, and that's wrong. Um, so I don't agree um, with the petition response um, uh, that is before us today. Um, secondly, I think um, probably the, the sensible thing to do here would have been to indicate to, to the petitioners that we have in reality taken a pay cut um, in the past year um, and that superannuation was reduced by 8%. Um, so look, there are things I think we could better communicate to the people of Brisbane through this um, petition process. And whilst I don't agree with um, Councillor Shree um, in, in his reasoning uh, for not supporting this response, um, I certainly would be happy to second a dissent, uh, sorry, a, um, uh, and a, um, oh God, division. sorry, oh, yeah, a division. Thank you, whoever said that, a division. Thank you, um, because I don't believe this is the appropriate um, response. I don't believe um, we've addressed the petitioner's concerns here. And I think that in the, um, in the current circumstances, we could be clearer and justify this um, certainly uh, more fully than we have here. So I'll certainly um, call for a division uh, as well, um, but I just don't necessarily agree with what Councillor Shree is saying. 
Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to be speaking on item uh, B and briefly on item C to um, address Councillor Shree's questions earlier in the debate. Mr Chair, I um, agree with the comments uh, of Councillor Strunk and Councillor Shree uh, and Councillor Johnston that have already been made on item B this evening. Um, I've already spoken extensively about uh, some petitions that may relate to uh, item B this evening, so I'm not gonna rehash those comments. However, um, I feel like the LNP are completely uh, missing the point here. Our petition process is clearly flawed. Uh, petitions that clearly breach not only the current council guidelines, uh, but also the law, have been approved uh, for publication on the council website and they have sat on the website uh, for months. One of those petitions has been the subject of a Human Rights Commission complaint, Mr Chair. Um, I am going to, again, uh, restate the key part of the public statement um, relating to that case that relates to the BCC process, just for completeness, so that it's definitely on the record when we put these things uh, to vote. And I'm going to quote again. This harm would never have happened if the Brisbane City Council had provided the petitioner with better feedback about the petition when he lodged it, including letting him know that it potentially breached the law and their guidelines and suggesting he talk to a lawyer. More accountability and better transparency should be expected from our elected representatives to aid democracy. Keeping government accountable is in everyone's best interest. If the petitioner had known the petition was potentially breaching the law and causing harm, he would never have sent it. Both the petitioner and the drag performers call for better communication and more responsibility for compliance with existing vilification and human rights laws to be exercised by the Brisbane City Council at the time of lodging petitions. So, uh, Mr Chair, it's all good and well for Council to say uh, in the response before us tonight that they are bound by the relevant legislation like the Anti-Discrimination Act or the Human Rights Act. However, being bound and actually enacting policy to effectively and actively deal with and ensure compliance with the relevant legislation is something else completely. Um, so uh, we won't be supporting uh, that response tonight. Um, I do understand that there was some discussion at the committee uh, on this matter and how exactly council could more effectively deal with petitions when they are submitted. Um, I absolutely welcome Councillor Allen considering those matters uh, and I am certainly happy uh, to consider working uh, with him in a bipartisan way moving forward. I think that we have proven in the past that we can work together uh, when it comes to these types of matters uh, as we did with the DB strategy. And I think it's very positive that he was open to considering those matters. And um, I'm just gonna leave that invitation open to him uh, for us to have those discussions moving forward because I do think that when these things happen, it gives us a great opportunity to improve the process. Um, this can have a positive outcome for the city and a positive outcome to ensure that things like this don't happen again. Um, on clause C, the petition requesting the use of council land adjoining Blimber State School, uh, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Shree, um, I do support this petition response. I, um, at a very similar time to this petition being uh, lodged, had my own petition on the matter, um, about upgrading the library. And unfortunately, when that uh, petition came back to council some months ago, uh, we didn't see any commitment of funds to upgrading the library. Um, and I, I spoke quite extensively about the makeup of and positioning of the library and the school and the kindy. Uh, and it really is uh, a precinct at that end of Oxford Street. Um, but because we haven't had any commitment to upgrade the library and potentially utilise that outdoor space in a way that I had anticipated would enable not only the school but the kindy and um, all sorts of other community groups utilising that space, um, you know, it is literally um, 
unused land, just sitting there, public land. Um, so I think it would actually be quite positive to see uh, the school be able to utilise that land. Um, I mean, just putting it out there might be a crazy thought, but um, having some sort of uh, joint initiative between council um, and the state government to actually upgrade that um, portion of the library uh, to turn it into something that uh, could benefit both the school and the council um, and the broader community and an outdoor learning space would be absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, I think that those discussions absolutely should happen. Um, and I think there's there's great opportunity to integrate the space uh, in that way. So um, certainly I will be supporting the petition, but I also note that the petitioners, and I had a discussion with them about this, uh, were very conscious about making sure the wording of the petition was such that uh, it would be utilised until such time as it was needed for um, an upgrade. Uh, or, or, of course, um, if that could be done in some way in conjunction with the school, I think that would be a really positive outcome for the community. So um, I will be supporting Clause C tonight. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Point of order. Yeah, it's a point of order. Yes, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I just ask that item D be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. No, item D. Sorry. So, Councillor Johnston, B or D? Uh, D, thank you. D. So, mm -hmm. the interest of the group items B and D are now both seriatim. Further speakers? Uh, uh, I see no further speakers. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I thank all the councillors who've um, contributed to uh, to the debate. Um, obviously, a number of items there uh, uh, were somewhat emotive, but um, turning to item B or clause B, um, the statement by Councillor Shree that there um, didn't appear to be any mechanism for for reviewing petitions, it's, it's not accurate. There is a, a mechanism for doing that. Um, and certainly council officers are uh, aware of the various legislation under which they act. Um, certainly there is a degree of um, subjectivity and interpretation that needs to take place. Um, I'm very conscious though in our petition process that we are careful not to censor things purely on subject matter. Um, certainly I'm conscious of the manner in which um, petitions are phrased and worded is important. As I've indicated to Councillor Shree, I'm very happy to, um, to take um, any ideas that he might have around how that um, process might be improved. He's made some suggestions in, in committee this morning and obviously the nature of this particular response is last week's committee, but uh, I am open to uh, some of the suggestions he's raised. And so certainly, um, you know, we are conscious of freedom of speech, freedom of opinion. Um, Councillor Shree has been a great beneficiary of freedom of speech and uh, certainly uh, some of the activities and the things he said in the past have, have offended um, cross sections of the community. Um, so we recognise that this is a, an area that's sensitive. Uh, there is a degree of uh, judgment and subjectivity required, but certainly uh, we're very keen to ensure that our policies and our procedures are robust and that they reflect uh, the laws and the expectations of the day. So I'll leave that item B with that. In the context of the, um, the lease and the arrangement with council and the Belimba State School, um, I think that's a, a good use of uh, the site or coming to an agreement where we can work with the uh, state school to, to better leverage that site. It is um, an area that we, we should be optimising, but I do think, uh, Councillor Cook, through you, Mr Chair, that we need to be sure that uh, in the near term, whatever arrangements are negotiated, that both parties are clear as to the, the expectations in the near and medium term. Um, the point that Councillor Shree raised in committee was that he, he his major concern was around um, the potential um, inability of council to um, draw back on that particular lease at some stage in the future. And uh, accordingly, he wasn't supportive of the, uh, the, the, um, the petition. But I do think that those uncertainties can be uh, made clear and ironed out 
in the, uh, the, the, the negotiation process between the Education Department and Council. And uh, on to the, uh, the final item, um, D. Um, this is clearly one where um, councillors do work hard. Um, I think that the points Councillor Shree makes are perhaps viewed through the filter of his own view on life. Um, I, for one, have had uh, members of my family who've been without work over, over recent months due to COVID-related uh, issues. And I think everybody in this chamber would have seen and be aware of people who are suffering through this period. So to say that we're not conscious of that, I think is incorrect. I think we have a, a deep understanding of what's happening across the community. Um, we are dedicated and working uh, you know, extensively with our communities around assisting them with whatever we can, can do as local councillors. Um, you know, Councillor Shree has a view that, you know, a 30% pay cut could be appropriate. And all I'd say, Councillor Shree, is that I'm conscious that you don't spend 100% of your time on council business, that you are distracted with other um, causes, and, and that's your prerogative. But, you know, at the end of the day, How dare you? this chamber How dare is you? very committed to I undertaking their council work. And I will close on that note. Thank you. All right, I'll now put items A and C. Shame on you, Councillor Allen. I'll now put items A and C. All those in favour of items A and C, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Uh, the ayes have it. Now on item B, all those in favour of item B, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And, and those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. Ayes have it. Division. 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 Cassidy, please ring the bells. Councillor Allen, I'm very disappointed to see you resorting to personal attacks. I thought better of you. Uh, all right, councillors on item B, all those in favour, say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you, please lower your hand. Those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. no. Councillor McLaughlin's screen's frozen. Yeah, no, he's a no, clearly. Councillor McLaughlin, no, nah, it's a, we're on the no's at the moment. You're welcome to join us, Councillor McLaughlin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Larry. He's in charge. Lux, please um, read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 18 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. We now move to item D. All those in favour of item D, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. The ayes have it. Division. Yeah, division. Division call by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shree. Please ring the bells. <laughs> Councillors on item D, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. aye.
Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, ayes have it, the voting being 22 in favour and two against. The ayes have it. That concludes the committee reports. Councillor Chair. I to you, uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I was just wondering if Councillor Allen wanted to take the opportunity to perhaps withdraw his previous comments, which re reflected adversely on the amount of time I spend working as a oh, council. No, no, I appreciate that. Um, I, um, uh, I must, uh, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time. I'm not sure. Give me a second. Councillor Shree, I apologise for this. Um, uh, in future, could you please, uh, if you'd like someone to withdraw, could you please do it while they're speaking? Um, I'll now move on to petitions. Councillors, are there any petitions? Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnson, your microphone yeah. is not on. It doesn't appear to matter when we raise um, points of order about attacks on non-LMP councillors. You and the Deputy Chairman are continuing to ignore the rules. Um, so I'm, I'm unaware that it has to be done immediately. And I would, I think you need to address Councillor Shree's point of order and make a ruling on it. I have made a ruling. Uh, councillors, are there any petitions? Well, yeah. Uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two petitions. One requesting that all News Corp papers and TV media no longer be given exclusive access to council operated premises. And the second one requesting council no longer grant development applications for change of use for off site student rooming accommodation unless uh, requirements are met. Further petitions? Councillor Adaman. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a petition for a non-motorised BMX track in the Kenmore Hills and Brookfield area, e-petition 407 signatories. Thank you. Any others? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I have a petition proposing the creation of a memorial grove in Anzac Park to Wong to be known as the National Defence Chaplain's Memorial Grove. Share the petitions. Councillors, may I please have a resolution to accept the petitions? Mr. Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned <coughs> consideration and report. Seconded. Been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against no, and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, is there any uh, other matters of general business? Are there any, firstly, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? Point of order, Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Landers. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council adjourn for a 15 minute break, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Adams, that this uh, Council adjourn for a period of 15 minutes. Uh, What's going on? You've been going late every night for months no, and now... No, I'm speaking. No, please don't speak while I'm speaking. Point of order, point of order, Mr Chairman. No, I must deal with one point of order at a time. Um, what a joke. You uh, haven't done this, you haven't done this. Um, that the council now break for a period of 15 minutes for the purposes, purposes of a brief tea break. All those in favour, excuse me, uh, the 15 minutes commences when all councillors have vacated the meeting. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Those against say no and raise your hand. Thank you. The ayes have it. Councillor Allen, I'd appreciate the courtesy of a phone call.